Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, and so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show. Booyah! Well, here we are, everybody, and I'm not going to be depressed. I'm not going to be sad. The Cavs don't deserve it, guys. The Cavs are garbage. They played like garbage. Uh, they're a gutless basketball team, and that's, you know, pretty much sums it up. But we'll get your thoughts on it in a minute. We Here we are. It's a Thursday edition of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show with G and Jason and me. And a lot to get to today. Uh, Terrell Brandon, some people call him Brandon Terrell, <laughs> is expected to join us a little later in the show. Uh, we'll, we'll hope for the best there. We'll hope to call him by the proper name. And uh, we'll talk about the Guardians. We will talk about Giannis and the Bucks getting eliminated and all that. But, guys, uh, before we jump into all of it, let's get to my bet. By the way, I'm making people a lot of money out there. So, I, I'm, I'm expecting tips from all you who are making money off me. Go ahead, Mike. Bull is 16-8 and eight on his baseball bets, 30-24 and 24 overall here. So, we are going to continue to ride with our guy, Bull, and his daily bet with Bet Rivers. Hey, Ohio, Bet Rivers Online Sportsbook is the place to be for every single game. Right now is the perfect time to join Bet Rivers Sportsbook when you use the deposit code SPORTS. You receive a second chance bet up to $500. Get in on all the action with weekly specials on your favorite sports like basketball, baseball, and hockey. To help you win big, Bull is 16-8. and eight. Don't forget that. Check them out at BetRivers.com. Download the Bet Rivers app today. For the latest lines, odds, and boosts. And, Bull, your last double bet day for the next six because Anthony will be gone. Wow. Shoot. Mike cannot handle a double bet day. Uh, I had the di- uh, Diamondbacks yesterday minus a run and a half, right? That was my pick. And they won by two, correct. They won two to nothing. So, it, took, it was closer than I thought, but it was good enough. Two bets today. I like the Pirates. Plus, the Pirates are playing great baseball, one of the biggest surprises in all the big leagues. Eventually, they'll come back to earth, but not quite yet. One guy I really believe in in the Pirates, I believed in him for a long time, and he's finally pitching like the guy I thought he would be. Mitch Keller, top prospect, struggled his first few years in the big leagues. Right now, he's pitching great. The Dodgers are favored, even though the game's in Pittsburgh, even though the Pirates are playing better, and even though Mitch Keller's been real good. I like the Pirates to win. I'll take the run and a half, but I think they win outright. And uh, even though he spelled White Sox wrong, uh, that's why I'm going against it. Uh, the White go- Soxes. White Soxes. No White Soxes. Uh, this is I'm what happens the- when you send the bet in at 1045. Yeah, that's true. It was late. You know, listen, I'm very timely in general, guys. You know that. But I was a little late today. It wasn't. Was it 1045? It you was said 10- the bet about 1035. But uh, that is- 1025. 1025. No. No. Or 1030. Uh, anyway, I'm taking the Rays. They've been winning every game. I think they'll win by two. The White Sox are absolute trash. Uh, big, one of the biggest surprises in the league. I think the Cardinals are the biggest disappointment. But anyway, baseball later, guys. Let's get right into it. And let's begin with, with the biggest topic. Who do you blame the most for the Cavs losing in five games, G. Bush? While y'all get started, I'm going to get me some Tylenol and take this right now because these dudes is giving me a headache. So what we're going to do before I even get into it, I need to get myself together and prepared to talk about this. Okay, tragedy. look at Go that, ahead, Jason. Jason. So you start us off. Who do you blame the most for the Cavs losing in five? Boy, it's hard to pick one. <laughs> it, it really, it really is. I mean, when you lose in five, there's plenty of blame to go around. Everybody, yeah. ha- everybody has to share in it. Is it's there not- anybody that doesn't get any blame? I don't think there's a single person. Uh, Robin Lopez. Okay. <laughs> I don't no blame. blame I don't Robin. blame Robin Lopez. Yeah, I don't, don't blame, blame Sam Robin. Merrill. Yeah. Uh, I don't blame Nito. Neto. Raphael. Let's yeah, what about him. what about Mama D? I don't blame Mama D. him. That's Mobley's brother, right? I don't blame no, no, him. No, no, no. Oh no, Mobley's brother. I don't blame him either. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't blame Donovan's dad. Yeah, no. He was there. I don't yeah. blame him. I do blame Donovan. Yeah. I, 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 you know, if you're gonna make me pick one, I'm, I'm actually gonna pick Donovan because he's the one that was on the floor and he had a terrible series. Yeah. They brought him here for situations like this, and he didn't deliver. Two years in a row. He got run by Brunson in the first round. He's been in the league six years. He's won two playoff series. He's never made a conference final. You, you got a lot to prove now, as far as I'm concerned, with Donovan Mitchell. And and I'm going to put a lot of blame on Kobe for constructing this roster. You know, I was joking with some people yesterday. They were complaining about JB. I, I, I don't know if JB is any good or not. I don't know. But I know that you gave him hamburger helper and spoiled milk and told him, told him to go bake a cake. And this is what you get. So there's plenty of blame to go around, but – I'm putting it on roster construction and Donovan Mitchell. G. Bush. Um, 
like you said, Jason said a lot. Um, there's a lot of people I could just, it, it, to me, it's any, many, mighty mo. I could blindfold myself and just pick somebody, and, and, and that would work well for me. Um, but, but I'm going to go um, also to roster construction. Um, one of the big glaring issues is the fact that they really didn't do anything at the All-Star break to, to make this team better. They got rid of Kevin Love, and we can all say right now that looks like a huge mistake. Um, they also, in, in constructing this roster, have Jared Allen and Evan Mobley playing beside each other, which now we know does not work. Um, that is not going to be something moving forward that's tenable, that's going to win you championships. And then I, I'll throw a slight little bit of this on, on JB. Yes, you had you had a terrible, not, not the ingredients you wanted to, to, to do what you want to do, but at the end of the day, there's one thing that you, is free. Effort is free. Intensity is free. Work ethic is free. And, and the attitude and nastiness is free. I didn't see none of those free, three, free things being offered this series. And I could understand if the Cavs got beat straight up in Brunson and Julius Randle just outplayed us, right? Great. I'll clap it up for him and I'll show us some love because I believe in competition and I believe in saluting people who win the game. But I won't say that I'm satisfied with this season because the way that they ended this season was a joke because they didn't offer any resistance. They looked like they didn't even care to be there yesterday. And now we look to see what they're going to do moving forward. But no, I, I, I go to roster. Uh, I go to roster creation and also um, the coach and figuring out why the heck can't we look like we fighting? Okay. Okay, guys, you know, Jason, you said this was hard. And I understand what you're saying. It's hard because everybody played like crap mm -hmm. and everybody shares in the blame. However, to me, it's easy. Because although I can give a percentage of blame to everybody, you are 100% right. The biggest culprit is not the coach. It's not the roster construction, which both played a, a role in this. It is Donovan Mitchell. There's no doubt about it. The Cavs traded every asset they had. Not some, not most. Every, well, I guess most because they still have Darius Garland Darius and, Evan. and Evan Mobley. But besides Darius and Mobley, they literally traded every asset they had. And he was supposed to be a difference maker. The Cavs, if they didn't make this trade, would have been a good team this year. They would have probably made the playoffs, even without the Donovan Mitchell trade. Would they have, could they have done any worse? I guess they could have gotten swept. Okay, well, does that matter? They really couldn't have done anywhere. If they had Colin Sexton, who sucks, and Larry Markkinen, who had a great year, they would have been just as good. Maybe they would have won less games in the regular season, and maybe they would have been a five seed or a six seed or whatever. I don't know. Maybe they would have been in the play-in. I don't think they would have. I still think they would have made the playoffs yeah, they would have. and would have done just as much as they did here. You brought in Donovan Mitchell because he's supposed to be the, be the big swing, and you know what? I heard everybody going bananas for this guy. Scores 71. I don't give a shit about his 71 freaking points. 71, who cares? The regular season don't mean squat. Nothing. It, it's meaningless. If they bring this exact team back next year, I'm sorry. I'm derelict in my duty as a sports guy, but I will not watch the Cavs play in the regular season. I'm telling you right now, I'm not, if, if they make changes, I'll watch. If they don't make any changes, I'm not watching a game. If that leaves me unable, I will read recaps and see highlights. I won't watch a game. That's it. I have no interest. The regular season means nothing. His performance this year means nothing. I don't want to hear all these idiotic debates that we and every other nitwit in this town had all season. Should, why is Donovan Mitchell not in the MVP conversation? Why is he not on NBA first team? Who gives a freaking crap? He sucked when it mattered the most. He was absolute trash. I don't want to hear about roster construction. Yes, that played a role. It shouldn't have mattered in this series. It shouldn't have mattered. Jalen Brunson played like a star. He did. Julius Randle's the second best player in the Knicks. He sucked the whole series, pretty much. He did not. He was a non-factor, a minor factor. But but Brunson, with help from contributors, obviously Hart played well, and the two big guys played well. But Jalen Brunson was the star. He put the Knicks on his back, and he carried them to a championship. That 23.2 per game is completely misleading because of game one. He was great in game one. He was good in game two, and he was 
beyond trash at three, four, five. This guy doesn't belong in a superstar conversation. He doesn't belong in an MVP conversation. The only series he won, I think, was in the bubble, right? Isn't that the only time he's ever won a series? He did not series. actually win that series. When he scored 50 points twice. Oh, they lost the first they round lost that year? in the first round He's that won series. two series in six years. Two series in six years. Always some excuse. And I'm sure by the end, in two months, he'll probably be whining to be out of here because everybody's a bunch of whiners. Instead of trying to come back and win, I want to go somewhere else. Everybody always wants to go. They always want to take their bull and go home. That's because our society today is soft. Bunch of wimps, these young guys. This was a, f oh, I want to drop an F-bomb so bad. It's embarrassing that we can. It's a terrible job out of us that I can't drop an F-bomb. But <laughs> they were <laughs> disgusting. And Donovan Mitchell is without a doubt to blame. And if you're at home, Listen to me, you people on YouTube. I'll look at this camera and that camera and that camera. If you're playing JB, listen, JB don't know what the hell he's doing. Let's be honest. All right? That's a little too strong. JB didn't do a great job. It's not that he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He didn't do a great job. Late in the game, when they purposely fouled and Darius Garland fouled out of the game, that was a major failure in coaching. The game was 99% over. You can't let your second best player foul out. He should have been pulled out of the game there when he fouled out on defense, you're purposely fouling, you take him out of the game, some, you foul, and then after the first free throw, you bring, you bring Darius back in for offense. That was a major flaw. And there were some mistakes he made, no doubt. But honestly, first of all, in this town, all we do is ever blame the coach for most things. We apologize for the players, and that's a soft mentality. The players lost this game. Blame JB deserves some blame, and so does roster construction. But the players, more than any other sport, Jason, you know this better than anybody, it's all about the players in the NBA, right? All about the players. If the Cavs had won this series, would we be lauding JB for his brilliant moves? No. It's all about the players, and more importantly, it's all about the stars. And the stars played like shit. That's it. Simple. End of story. All f their four best players were all crap in this series. So, and that's why they lost. But mostly, Donovan Mitchell played like a freaking scrub. That's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. I, I actually don't have a problem with what Bull just said. Because uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Um, when you are a superstar, I saw, I saw back in the day when Kobe Bryant refused to shoot against the Phoenix Suns, right? He sat on, he was like, man, y'all think y'all so good? Go ahead, do your thing. I, I've seen what LeBron got. When you are the best player on a team, that's what happens. If you don't get them over the hump, you the man, you're going to get the critical, and you're going to get the most blame. And I do believe his numbers is misleading, and it's right. It looks like he's doing his thing, but when it came up to big moments, when you needed a big shot, when you needed a big stop, he was not there to deliver what he was supposed to. But, however, he didn't play the worst in this series. The person who played physically the worst in this series, I do not want to see back on this roster completely. Jared Allen, to me, not only when people, Jared Allen is the heart and soul of your team. No. Jared, look at yeah. that stat line. And I don't say I could do a lot of things, but four points and four rebounds. And the most damning part about the situation is his body language. His body language looked sheepish. It looked coy. It looked shy. It looked passive the entire game. At some point, he was just running up and down the court, getting cardio like this, trotting. When he he couldn't catch the ball, he couldn't defend anybody. He could. And we're not going to talk about the physical nature of it. I'm going to say this. Just because Jared Allen was one of the first people we got on this team and signed him to a contract, that's our damn fault. That don't mean you good. That just means he is better than what you had. Jared Allen cannot be a major part of this team moving forward if you want to win a championship because he's unplayable against solid bigs. And when people say, well, Jared Young, Jared Allen is it? He's he is. Well, how does Jared Allen 25, 26? He's 25. He, he's been in the league. What was he's six, been in the league. Years? Six you, years. you don't, yeah, you don't, come you don't come. This was his third trip to the post. Yeah, I mean, by come the on. Way. Yeah. Third trip. And you don't come back with heart. Heart no. is something no. that you either you a rough rider or you not. He don't you don't come back with no no heart, no aggressiveness. And I, I thought the series was dead when even yesterday Julius Randle put his clothes on. Julius Randle didn't even keep a uniform on. He said, let me get my street clothes on. I'm gonna go sit over here, put a hat on and go post up. And they still Obi Toppin comes in as like, don't don't worry, I got you, big dog. Twelve points, I got you, dog. Twelve points. Obi Toppin, like, like, 
the Cavs roster is just it's just not it's just not good enough. And by the way, I'm rethinking where they are, right? We thought they was coming in at four, but after the playoffs, I don't believe that you better you the Knicks, you sure not better than Knicks. Uh, you're sure as hell not better than the Heat, and you might not be better than the Hawks. So if you want to run it back, yeah. be, be, be my be my guess because. I don't believe you could. You you might be a seven seed next year. Yeah, Jason, think about this for a minute. Like, and, and I'm not going to get into detail on this because we'll talk a little more about it later. The eight seed Heat beat the Bucks in five games. The seven seed Hawks, who most people thought would get swept by the Celtics, maybe a gentleman sweep at best, took, forced that series to six, playing a great fourth quarter to come back and extend that series. These teams are showing a lot of heart. Even the Nets, who are so undermanned right now, I know they got swept, but they like. They were winning all those games. Like the, they played, they played they were up in the, the second Nets half got three pieces. Of the four games. They were at least playing competitive basketball against a much better team in Philadelphia. The Cavs were the worst team in the East in the playoffs. It's funny be- to me that it's fascinating. Had the Cavs not made the Mitchell trade, I don't think anyone would be nearly as angry as as they are now. No, certainly not. Because if they ran back the team they had from last year, and I agree with everything you said, like. What, what did they gain by making the Mitchell trade? They're still out in the first round. Right. I, I wrote that this morning, actually. And I'm not opposed to the trade. Like, I didn't think it was a bad no, trade. Agreed. Like, you, got, you think your, your window's opening. You got a chance to win. A superstar becomes available. I'm still going to call him a superstar. He had a horrible series. Yeah. I'm going to call him a star. You pushed all in. You got him. But you could have gone out in the first round anyway. But it's if, if they ran this back and they lose with Markinen and they lose with Darius and Evan in the first round, everything goes the same. We're going to say, all right, well, hey, they took that step. Last yeah. year was the play-in. This year they made the playoffs. You know, they lost. It didn't go the way we wanted to, but that's okay. It's trading in the right direction. Everything changed when they made the Donovan that's trade. Right. Once you traded for Mitchell, you started the clock. And that's, right. and that's why so much anger and vitriol is coming out today from yes. all sides because, like, you set yourself up for this. This is what you wanted. You that's exposed right. yourself to this, and now you have to deal with it. Go ahead, Mikey. I got it. Bunch of super chats actually that we got to get to real quick before we move on here. And as always, when we read super chats, it's brought to us by our dear friends at PCC Airfoils. If you're looking for a job with career advancement and great benefits, well, PCC Airfoils is a leading manufacturer in Northeast Ohio. All locations of PCC Airfoils in East Lake Menor, Wycliffe, and Minerva are hiring for all positions starting at $18 and up, plus full benefit packages, paid time off. And a signing bonus you can apply online at precast.com slash careers to learn more. The chat is going crazy right now. We appreciate everyone chiming in on who deserves the most blame. We're going to touch on the Cavs in a bunch of different topics in a sec. But By the way, anybody blaming JB more than, as the top blame, you give him percentage blame, anybody blaming JB the most should delete their account on YouTube. They should delete their <laughs> well, account we did on a poll because they're a nitwit. It's, it's, we, we did a YouTube poll, and I'm going to let Anthony read the results real quick. Yeah. But JB was not number one. Anthony, how did the poll go? All right, so the poll, who's to blame the most? Uh, we got 33% with Donovan Mitchell, 31% for JB. That's and actually, Donovan Mitchell just tied the front court for 33%. Don- Darius Garland at 2%. He's safe. Nobody's putting it on his shoulders. So that's I, the poll. I have some super chats to read. Then we'll the move on to the next 31% that part. voted for JB. I mean, that's silly. you're embarrassing yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first super chat from Tyler Becker. I put my Jared Allen jersey on eBay first thing this morning. I'll always ride or die with the Cavs, but, man, I'm disappointed to be a fan of this team right now. 2016 NBA Champs 216 says Jared Allen got flat out punked this entire series. Brody's bottom line says, so Mitchell only got eight rebounds in two games? I think he means Allen. Allen Allen, only had eight rebounds in two games. Uh, Bob Byler says Stefanski and Bickerstaff are both soft, and it shows in both their teams. Isaiah C. said this during Bulls' rant. Bulls should have coached with that kind of energy. I can't wait to see him at Little League practice tonight when me and Anthony go out there to throw some strikes. And last one from Justin DW. The front court guys need to toughen up. Mitch single-handedly controlled them both. I think next year y'all will be top three, but Knicks to the Eastern Conference Finals. I know one way to get the front court to toughen up. Let's force feed them built bars nonstop sure. this summer. Let's go from a combined weight of about 215 for Allen and Mobley yeah. to 275 if they're in 12 yeah. built bars a day. And you could use promo code LOCKDOWN15 for 15% off at built.com on all built bars. So let's go to that next real quick. Yeah, he, uh, G. Bush yeah we can get Allen. to that one second just really quick, okay. and then we're going to switch gears. Um, uh, just to follow up on your thought, I just want to say one one thing is that somebody tweeted to me and said, well, the Cavs are ahead of schedule. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Once, it, as you said, 
if they had not made the trade, I think they'd be on schedule even with a loss in the first round. Once you traded for Donovan Mitchell, the schedule changed. Yeah, it's we'll get into simple. that. I'm going to explain it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because okay, we've good. hinted about it for weeks, and I've caught, sort of waited to see how the season would end. Yeah. And we'll lay it all out. Yeah, it's going to be a up. lot to get to. All right. And to your point that you just said, Mike, as we get to the front court here, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley were out-rebounded by Mitchell Robinson over the last two games. They were almost out-rebounded by Josh Hart. Go, go, pull up Josh Hart's numbers last night. I think Josh had one less. A guard had one less than Mobley and Allen I'm combined. Beyond ridiculous. Here, have another water. You're going to need it. <laughs> I'm go- definitely going to need it. So here's the thing. G just went off about you can't play Jared. I mean, I can't believe how bad these guys were. I can't even make a case. You think about their four best players. I can't make a case for any of them doing anything good. But specifically on the front court, guys, when it comes to changing it up, yes, it feels like right now, okay, you got to you change it up. Here's the problem. If, if they try to trade Jared Allen, why would anybody give up anything? He's making $20 million a year. He's nev- He just showed you he's play, played gutless basketball in the playoffs. His numbers for the whole series, nine and a half, seven and a half. What were, his, what were his points and rebounds, Mike, for just the last three games? I'd love to know that. It was probably like five and three. Very low. I will look that up, but it, it's but very, very low. Jason, what are the, what are they going to do about this front court? Is it possible to make a change, and if so, how? Well, here's before we get to that, here's what's most disappointing to me about – this is why I'm so disappointed in Jared. Yeah. Mitchell Robinson made fun of you after the game three. Yes, he did. He made fun of you with the shiver and the woo and, yeah. and you know, they're shook. What was your response? They let them punk your ass again in four and five. Yes. That's on Jarrett. That's on Donovan. That's yes. on JB. That's on everybody. We saw what happened in the Memphis series when Dylan Brooks ran his mouth and acted yeah. like a, a moron yeah. and how the Lakers responded to that. Yeah. Although Memphis did a good job yesterday winning the game. Yeah, but, but fine. they'll win. They'll lose the series. L- yeah. Lakers are going to win this yeah, series. Yeah. But, but to just roll over again Pathetic. after they made fun of you. Yeah. They made fun of you. They well, said and, you're and Jason, soft. To your point, last night, late in the game, um, Mitchell Robinson crushed Darius on a foul and then, like, stood over him, and nobody, and nobody did, anything. did anything. Nobody did Gutless. anything. Gutless. <laughs> so, I'm not going to sit here and say – I'm not going to say trade Jared Allen based on this series. I'm not going to say that. He, he had a terrible series. Mm. He has been a tent pole to what they do defensively. He is in the regular season. He's a linchpin to what they do. And I'm not going to let one series say you have to trade Jared Allen. But – the bigger picture is what we alluded to earlier. Can you win in today's NBA with two non-shooting bigs? I mean, there's five guys in the paint. When Ev- I mean, Evan's three-point shooting regressed this year. He's down to like 21%. So he's a non-shooting big right now. Jared Allen's a non-shooting big right now. So you have those two guys, the two guys guarding them. There's four. And yeah. whoever's guarding Isaac Okoro, there's five. Right. Or Lamar Stevens, whatever. There's five guys in the paint yeah. in a playoff series. You can't win that way. There's nowhere. And that's why I blame Donovan. I'm going to give him the bulk of the blame. But at the same time, I'll acknowledge there's nowhere for him to go on the court. Like, you can't. There, there's Zero. no room. Because they're, they're, they, the floor isn't spaced properly. So, for that reason, I think you do have to look at trading Jarrett, but you're right. Like, what do you get for Jarrett? It's kind of like Ahmad Rosario as a left fielder. That's why they moved him back to shortstop. He has yeah. no trade value as a left fielder. What value does Jarrett Allen have as a seven foot rim running center who's making 20 million who doesn't shoot? All the, the, the best bigs today are skilled bigs who can dribble, pass, and shoot. That's not Jarrett. Jarrett's not a shooter. He does shoot threes at the end of practice, but that's it. He's not a guy who's going to stretch the floor for you, and you're not moving on from Evan Mobley. So I do think that they have to explore that, and I actually started calling a couple people this morning around the league like, okay, what are you you going to give me for Jared Allen right now? What are you going to give me? And I never really got a good response. Like, I I don't know. I haven't looked at it. But you're not going to get what you really need, which is a, a wing who can dribble, pass, and shoot. Like, those guys are the most valuable commodities in the league. That's what this team is missing. That's what they've been missing since LeBron left, and they've never been able to fill that spot. They traded for Lowry Markkinen, and they reworked him into being a three, and then they needed Lowry for the Donovan trade. <clears throat> but that's the biggest, most glaring hole on this team, is wings who can dribble, pass, and shoot, especially the shooting part. I'm going to say it all offseason. Shooting, 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 shooting. They've got to find more shooting. I don't know how they're going to do it right now. I don't know if Jared Allen's going to bring it back, but I do think that's something you have to explore, which is nuts. Because 11 days ago, we never would have said that. Uh, earlier this season, I had Cavs people tell me it doesn't matter what happens with, with Donovan because we've got Evan, Jarrett, and Darius, and that's Stop. a great threesome to have. Stop. But I don't know that you can say that anymore. <laughs> Hell no, you can't say that anymore. Specifically the front court. <laughs> I, I, obviously, you don't think it's 
uh, you can bring back the same front court. No, listen, Jared Allen. To me, it's just man, I, you know, I, it's so many. It's, and I'm not a loss for words so many times, but just to break it down on a basketball level and just so people just don't get too emotional because they'll just say you guys are just being just over the top negative. Listen, man, if you can't beat the Knicks and, and no disrespect to the Knicks and I said this before. See, this is the problem here in Cleveland. We got to understand what the barometer is when we get hit with the barometer. It's an awakening and instead of calling it what it is. We want to punt it down the street and just hope for the best. Let's just hope that they turn into something. The New York Knicks are a nice team. They're not winning the championship. Nope. They're nowhere. They're close to winning no championship. Nope. Like, although they might end up in the Eastern Conference they may Finals. Go, they may go wild. to the Eastern Conference yeah. Finals, but the reality check that you got in the playoffs is you saw what your roster was. Now, is either you going to be a, a, a proactive about it and believe it? Or you want to put your head in the sand and, and bury it in hope. This team is nowhere close to competing with as as what this roster is nowhere. I, when you talk about the front court, not only was he out rebounded by Mitchell, Hartenstein, Toppin, Josh Hart. There was times Brunson had seven, eight rebounds, six, seven rebounds. Those things are not conducive. What we overestimated was the fact that Evan Mobley, we throw a unicorn out there a lot. Listen, we need, we need. It was more like My Little Pony. It ain't no unicorn yeah. right now. Right now, Evan Mobley is a five. That's what he is. He is a center. They need to play him as a center. At least if he is a center, he could play at 15 feet, take a couple triples, and get to the basketball. But all the all the pipe dreams of him pulling up like Kevin Garnett or Dirk Nowitzki or any of that that is not in the books right now. And if you want to bank your team on that. You're gonna you're gonna go back a couple of steps because you're you're not gonna make the the the, the changes you need to make because you hoping Mobley get there. They got to play him at five. They need to go find a stretch four of some sort that can shoot and go with him at, at five. But but the the, the 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 twin towers people forget Tim Duncan and David Robinson used to hit a 15 foot jumper. We got two guys that can't do that. So stop saying twin towers. They got to split this apart. It's not gonna work. They need to figure out and that's why I love about LeBron. LeBron put maximum pressure on the organization. That's why people don't really ever embrace getting LeBron because LeBron tells you don't tell me how hard it is. Just get it done. And at this offseason, somebody has to tell Kobe Altman that that's your job to upgrade the roster. We don't care what you got to do. Lie on the telephone. Do what you need to do. But this roster cannot come back as is. By the way, there were a lot of people at the trade deadline. Our fans do this all the time. They do this with the Guardians all the time. They were like, well, let's not mess with the chemistry. Oh, Lord. Now, the Cavs didn't have anything to trade anyway, so I don't know that they could have gotten anything. But like this this whole don't mess with the chemistry is stupid. It showed you once again. It turns of specifically of the, of the front court, guys. I think the Cavs are in a, in a tough spot. It doesn't feel like, yes, it is somewhat prisoner of the moment to say, well, we don't want to bring this front court to back the same because they played so badly in the series. That's a little unfair. In the end, though, I, I still think what you said, the paint's too clogged. It would make sense to move on from Jared Allen. However, I just don't see a team's knocking on the Cavs' door too much to trade for Jared Allen. But let me ask you this about Evan Mobley, Jason, because we've all thought, you know, Evan Mobley, the, the ceiling is, is the sky. Has the way he played in the playoffs changed that opinion at all or no? Because it's he is really young, doesn't matter. My opinion on him hasn't changed Unchanged. at all. Now, again, in the regular season, he shot 21% from three. That's yeah. got to be higher. He's got to get better at shooting threes yeah. to really reach his maximum potential. Here's the thing to remember about Evan. I mentioned this a few months ago. The Cavs are in a unique, uh, in a unique position because their best piece came last. And usually – your best piece comes first. You're a bad team. You tank, whatever. You have a yeah. high draft pick. You get your foundational piece, and then you build other pieces around them. And the downside to that is, you know, you're in year four or five before you make the playoffs for the first time, and now you're up against this contract. So that's the downside to doing it that way. The advantage the Cavs have is they drop their best piece in last, so they have a lot of space now before they have to worry about his next contract. The flip side, the downside of that is – 
he came last. He's only 21. Right, right, this right. is only his second year, and you're asking him to play a major, major role against grown-ass men in this series yeah. when typically guys in his position are on rebuilding teams winning 30, 35 games, right. and he's got a lot of time to grow and develop and mature. Again, when they brought Donovan in, it sped up his timeline too. That's right. And all of a sudden, the development of Evan Mobley took a backseat to winning, which it had to. That's the way it is. So, And I, I wrote it this year. I absolutely think – some of Evan's growth was stunted by bringing Donovan here because you put the ball in Donovan and Darius's hands. Right. They're the engine that drive this team. And Evan, you're going to have to get the scraps and figure it out where you can. Right. As opposed to if Donovan wasn't here, there would have been a lot more of Darius going to focus to on Mobley. Evan. Yeah. Evan's growth. That's all gone. Right. Once you bring Darius. in, right. I don't have a problem with that necessarily, but it's going to stunt his growth. That's just the nature of it. So I'm going to, I'm not going to give him a pass for this series, but I didn't think he was the problem. Like, he needs to make more shots in the paint. Yes. He needs to develop a better three-point shot. Yeah. Yes. But I, I saw nothing in this series that makes me say Evan is not the player. I know a lot of people are coming down on Evan and say, yeah. stop with the Giannis, stop with the KG. I've always said Bosch. But Chris Bosch could hit a three. And that's that's where that's right. that's the part right. that, that Mobley, that's that's the part Mobley has right. to develop. And, and I would agree if of the four of their four big four, if you will, I'd blame him the least of the four guys, mm -hmm. but he didn't play. He didn't play well, but he has the most. I would give him the, the most excuse for 21 not 21 years well old in his second year, put in a really tough position. Yeah, before, all right, we're going to switch to the backcourt. Before now. we do First, that, let's go to I Mike. have a stat about Evan Mobley, and this stat's brought to us by the USFL. I know we're talking basketball, but football season is still going on here in Ohio. Check him out down in Canton, USFL.com. Family fun for everybody. $10 a ticket, affordable, family-friendly fun. Check him out in Canton and around the country at USFL.com. Of all the things we could talk about with Evan Mobley, and he certainly was outplayed, out physical, and, and looked like a young player learning how to play in a postseason against a physical team, he still led the Cavs in overall plus minus. So when you look at to Jason's point, yeah. of all the players when they were on the court versus when they were off, he was their most efficient and most effective guy as far as keeping the Cavs within games. And I do agree with Jason that he deserves some blame, a small fraction in totality, but he is still 21, and we right. have to kind of temper our expectations. He gets the right. He played like he didn't play well. He did not play well. And G's point of we thought he was a unicorn. He played like a My Little Pony doll in this series. Mm -hmm. That's totally fair. Yes. But in totality, he was not the reason they lost this season. No, he's no. not. So. He not like he. Listen, he's Evan Mobley is a second year player who's undersized. He ain't, he ain't got no meat on his bones at this point. And no, I'm not gonna come. It, it, if you think that the reason they lost is because of the coach or a second year player, you're not listening or trying to understand right. basketball. That is unequivocally false. You got you got veterans and the guys that should, should, should have been leading you were Evan Mobley, not excuse me, but Darius, or not Darius Garland, but uh, Jer Jared Allen because he is the energy guy. He is the hustle guy. And he, a veteran. And a veteran yeah. who's been there and Donovan Mitchell and they didn't. So, I'm not even, I, that's the reason I haven't killed Darius Garland yet, but we're going to yeah. get to him though. By the way, I'm going to take everybody behind the scenes, all right? Mikey McNuggets is in my ear. He's twice in the last 30 seconds said, Garland, he's like Garland and Mitchell next. Garland. I am running the show here, Mikey McNuggets. You should be aware that when I run the show, I know what the hell I'm doing around here. That's fact. Okay? You keep us I on knew, track. I knew we were starting with, uh, with the who's to blame. I was ready to transition to the big guys. I was ready to transition to the guards. You don't have to whisper it in my ear. I got to take but care of here. We got <laughs> We got to get to Kevin Love. At some point. That's is, next. Uh, that's coming up next. Don't right. worry. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned it briefly. I want to get back there, too. Let's talk about the guards specifically. Obviously, they were a disappointment. It is, inter <laughs> it is interesting that I know Garland's a little older than Mobley, but because Garland was better in the regular seat, like, it was his first playoff, too. Yep. We're not giving him a pass at all, even though he's not much older he's than He's got a $200 million dollar contract, and yeah. he's older. Right. He's been in the oh, league longer. And I'm not, I'm, I, I, I'm not giving him a pass, either. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think it's funny, because it was his first experience. So, you can understand his struggles a little. I would also blame him less, certainly less, than Donovan Mitchell. Yes. And I would actually blame him less than Jared Allen, even though more of is expected of him. But Jared Allen was awful. At least... Uh, Darius had moments, right. whereas Allen was completely useless the whole series. But specifically to the backcourt, obviously there were some – when you have two – essentially two point guards, two guys that are ball-dominant players, 
it's always going to be hard. It, it, and and that was the case at times with Darius and Donovan. Um, I don't know if there was any frustration by either player as this, you know, during the season or in the playoffs, whatever. It seemed like they get along really well. I don't know. Um, we do. There, there's been this. We've constantly talked about at some point Donovan Mitchell's going to want out of here. Uh, what do we think about this backcourt? How poorly they played, and what the expectation for them is going forward? I don't. I'm not. They weren't great in this playoff series, but yeah. I don't think that means that they're doomed to fail in every Agreed. playoff series. Yeah. I think that they could have a ton of success in the playoffs together. But now we can have the Donovan conversation, and we've sort of been hinting about it for a while. And I've been trying to push it off and kick it down the road. I don't yeah. want to talk about this until we saw how it ended for them. Now we can talk about it. The talk all year long has been Donovan's going to New York the first chance he gets. Like, every time I talk to people around the league, it's, well, Donovan's going to New York. Donovan had told you that. At his introductory press conference, he said, I thought I was going home. I thought I was going to New York. He went there last night. We didn't ask him about New York. He brought it up. He's the one who mentioned again and said, I'm, I'm over it. Well, are you really? Because you're the one who's still talking about it. I didn't bring it up to you. And then once he brought it up, that's when I said, okay, what did you mean by that? Like, then we had a little bit more right, of a New right, York right, conversation yeah. after the game last night, but only because he went there first. So you have two years of control left on Donovan Mitchell and then a player option year. More than likely, he's not picking up the player option. These guys want to get back into free agency and yeah. get their next contract as sure. soon as possible. You have two years left. Do you really think after all the assets that the Cavs gave up to acquire him that they're going to run the risk of leave, letting him leave and getting nothing in return for him? Right. No, you're going to have to trade him with a year left on his contract unless you get a big extension out of him, unless you get a commitment out of him. I don't think that's happening. From everyone I've talked to, he wants to go to New York. Now, does New York want him? I don't know. But that's where he wants to go. That's oh, where he wants to play. I mean, well, I mean, well, Jalen Brunson's yeah. outplayed him two years in a row now. That's true. And well, so there's together, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But that's that's not our. Yeah, yeah that's not, not our, our concern. Problem. Yeah. So that to, that tells me you have one year left with Donovan Mitchell next year. That's it puts it all on next year. That is the last time that you have him without having to worry about having this trade conversation. Right. And I'll say one other thing. And I wrote this today in The Athletic. In 2010, when LeBron left the first time, Dan Gilbert told all of the people close to him, I should have traded him with a year left on his contract. Now think about that. LeBron James, MVP, best player in the league. Yeah. Dan wanted to trade him in 2009. Says he should have traded him in 2009, and he would have come out and said he wouldn't commit to us. We can't, we can't risk losing the asset right. for nothing. We had to trade him. If he felt that way then, and he has said, I will never let another player hold my organization hostage again. Yeah. If he felt that way then, how do you think they're going to feel now and treat this now? Well, let me ask you two questions on follow-up to that. Number one, Dan is obviously not involved Dan with is, the team. Well, is I mean, that he's player, still, at The same way, the yeah. same way. Obviously involved, but not, not to the same degree as you pointed out. Does that change the dynamic of that I don't at think all? so because no, okay. Dan doesn't meddle on a day-to-day basis. His, what, the way it has been described to me in the past is Dan's voice isn't heard as often. But when he wants it heard, yeah. it is heard, It is and loud. Like this, he's in the mix. Yes, yeah. something like this, he is absolutely in the mix. So it's not so much the day-to-day stuff, but major decisions like this, he is still final say on stuff like this. All right, the other question is, if they talk, I would assume they might try to talk to Donovan Mitchell about an extension this offseason. Is that something they, could, they would do? I mean, I'm sure that the conversation is fluid and right. constant in terms of what he wants. If he makes it clear to them this offseason – that there's no chance he's staying here long term. Is there a chance they trade him this offseason? I I mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Because that, that gives you more opportunity to recoup more assets, but that would also be admitting a mistake that trading for him initially, if you trade for him and you go to the playoffs and lose and win one playoff game and lose in the first round and then immediately trade him again, that's admitting a mistake. And I don't know that they're ready to sit. To that's that this a catastrophic a mistake. mistake. And one other thing to keep in mind, you're going to see you're this is this is I mean, I'm we're talking about this now. You're going to hear this about Giannis in Milwaukee. You're going to hear this about Damian Lillard in Portland. All of these stars are going to start exiting. And there's only so many monster trade packages going around in teams that fit. Do you want to be first or do you want to be last right. in terms and, of trading these guys? And in terms in terms of well, you're admitting a mistake. Okay, sometimes you make a mistake. Is is it better to move on from the mistake? Not that Donovan Mitchell's a mistake because he's a great player and who didn't have a good series. I, I, 
I, we all thought it was the right thing to do. I still think it was the right thing to do yeah. at the time. But it may now be like if you say, well, if you don't trade him, if you trade him now, you're admitting a mistake. Well, if you wait one more year, you're saying, well, let's try to win a championship next year. Does anybody think the Cavs are going to win a championship next year? Not right now. I mean, it, that's. But you, I do think Evan Mobley in year three is going to take another leap. Okay. You know, I do think Garland is going to be better for this experience. Uh, they need help. They need bench but help. How are they going to get that? That's, I, that's I, the fascinating yeah, thing. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning who said, like, look at the heat. Max Struess played 30, I don't know, have front, almost 40 minutes last night. He was a league minimum guy that they developed. Uh, Gabe, help me out, Mikey. What's Gabe Vincent. Like? Thank you. Gabe Vincent. Me knowing that. Yeah, look That's at you. That's an upset right there. Gabe Vincent <laughs> played 39, 40 minutes. Yeah. League minimum guy. Kevin right. Love, they got off the scrap heap, got for nothing. League minimum guy. Duncan even, Robinson was an undrafted guy who they yeah. turned into a guy who got And they even lost, what's contract. his name? Uh, they had an injury. To Tyler one. Hero. Tyler got, Hero. The, the, but, the, but the problem yeah. is these are guys that are now two, three years into their development. Yeah. It's hard to find these guys and have them be instant contributors right yeah. now on a championship team. And the Cavs are out of time. If yeah. we're talking and, – and listen – I'm going to get this, like, this is going to, people are going to misunderstand this, that I'm saying they need to trade Donovan this summer. I'm not saying this. Blame him. He's the one that asked me the question. I, yeah. I'm not, but I know how this goes. I'm going to get blamed for saying yeah. that, that Donovan, that they need to trade Donovan yeah. now. No, That's not what I'm say saying. That. That's not what I'm saying. I do think they run it back next year with him right. and play this out again. But he will be traded I think next offseason, yeah, most likely. The way it stands now, barring something barring a deep, deep playoff run next right. year, barring a reason to get him to change his mind. I think the Cavs have to entertain the idea of trading him. See next that, so, so that's why, that's why, like you said in the beginning, if they run back the same roster, knowing that I'm not interested in watching them, not, not interested. I'm at not, all. I'm not going to watch because well, nobody ever runs it back the same. There's well, always change. I, I mean, but if you come back with the same core guys and some league minimum dude, like, because what we're saying is, okay, we can't get them for Jared Allen. Okay, well, Donovan Mitchell probably will leave and we'll have to trade him for something with two years left on his deal. And we still got Garland, who got $200 million, And we'll wait on Mobile. Like, where, in, where are the big changes? Where are the big... Here's what I'll say in defense of Kobe. In 2018, I wrote, they're screwed. They're, like, they, they, there is no way they can salvage this roster and fix this roster. And yeah. it was, I mean, the building was on fire. And right. he maneuvered enough. He found enough magic beans to get Rodney Hood in here and Jordan Clarkson in here, and they were not great players. But it changed enough of the dynamic of the locker room that it got the Cavs back to the finals. Now, they lost in the finals. But he made more moves than I thought I didn't see. I didn't see the path to getting some of that stuff done. He's gonna have to do that again. And I don't. And again, I'm looking at this going. I don't see the path. Yeah. I don't know tough. what it is. He's gonna have to do some real good work this offseason to make this team better, guys. Let's get to something else. I want to get to Kevin Love in a second. Well, one one last thing uh, on the current Cavaliers, and that's the coach JB Bickerstaff. Yeah. Obviously, he didn't do a great job in this no. series, but no. I think we all agree he's lower down on the blame list in terms of who you're blaming on the team. Is he definitely? Is he definitely back? Should he definitely be back? I think he definitely should be back, yes. And I know that's not very popular. I know people yeah. are going to scream and holler and say, you're an idiot, he's got to go. I think that's emotional and reactionary in the moment. I think it's an incomplete. I don't know how you can grade him. Look at what he was given. He, this is a coach, and I know you have to adapt your style to your personnel. I wholeheartedly agree with that. But he likes playing big. He's said it multiple times. He proved it last year with the market in Mobley Allen. He likes size. He likes playing big. He had no bigs to bring off the bench in this series. None. Dean Wade threw up all over his shoes. And he was the one guy who was the stretch four who we thought could stretch the floor, give him some rebounding. He was supposed to be that Kevin Love yeah. replacement. And he was just haunted by the by Kevin leaving Cleveland yeah. and fell apart. But let me but Jason, let me ask you this though. Like you just mentioned the heat. That's a like, Eric Spolster is one of the best coaches in the league, They are right? the anomaly. They're not the norm. But it proves that it is possible. Right. Like With it, good scouting, good development, good I, coaching, it's I don't possible. think it's a, it's a short thing that JB should be fired. I do think he's probably going to be back. But at least behind the scenes, if there's a better – if there's a guy you think is a better coach, shouldn't that be considered? Of course. And right? that's why I've said for months – a lot of teams are going to have the Ime Odoka conversation because he was the best coach on the market, and Houston beat everybody to the punch. Yeah, yeah. Houston knew that he was going to be the hottest coach on the market, and yeah. they snatched him now before other teams could really start making moves and, and, and firing their coaches. Right, right. Nick Nurse is out there. 
I know he won a championship. There's, there's just, I'm not sure that that's really, I mean, talk to people in Toronto. Yeah. I just don't know that that's really where you want to go. And outside of that, I don't know that there's a great coaching option out there. Right. That I wouldn't is just some random better. young coach. And that's, I mean, that's the thing. Like, that's, anytime you have a conversation with someone, a, a GM or front office guy about firing a coach, the first thing they say is, okay, who are you going to get? Right. You got to make sure you get somebody better than the guy you got, or what, do, what are we doing here? And that's the hard yeah. part of this. I don't think, listen, JB did not have a great series, but I, I would put him third or fourth or fifth on the list of why they're in this here, position. Here, here's, here's, here's why there's a, this is a major issue is because when JB does not have an offense, when you have a limited roster from a skill set standpoint, you cannot just roll the ball out there and run pick and roll all season and not develop any sort of go to like that's not going to work. And so what you ended up seeing at the end of the game is okay in, in this series. If Donovan and Darius don't do anything, we're screwed. If Donovan and Darius don't hit shots, we're screwed. There was no effort to get Evan Mobley into certain spots. I don't even know what his offensive game includes. I don't know where he likes to get the ball. That just means you haven't tried to develop it. You can't go into a season and just say, here you go. And then wonder why when everything bogs down, everything slows down, people are looking at you. And here's another indictment on JB. The bottom line is the pace of this team is entirely too slow. I agree with that. They are not an old, decrepit team. They got guys that are athletic and Garland and, and, and Mitchell that can get out. Evan Mobley can run the floor. Jared Allen can run the floor. Why are you playing the slowest pace mm. ever? You that means yeah. you get no easy buckets, you get no transition buckets, and they every, never throw those long Kevin Love passes. You, you can you can never yeah. you, everything is is the defense is set looking at you and saying, give me your best shot. And at least the Knicks, they're not a running team. But look how the Knicks sped the pace up. R.J. Barrett, when they were trying to come back, R.J. Barrett and, and Hart just pushing the ball. They quickly. were turning turnovers into easy baskets. Baskets. Night. And to your point on the pick and roll, I know I mentioned this on the show before. When I went and spent time with Mike Brown and, and the fantastic job he's done with Sacramento, and I'm thrilled for him. Mike's one of my favorite people in the league, and I think he's done a marvelous job in Sacramento. One of the first things he said to me was, in the postseason, teams are going to take away what you do best. You, you like to run pick and roll. That's the easiest thing to take out. What yeah. else do you got in your bag? That's right. And we and saw that play out in real time yeah. in this series. Mikey, you got something. Yeah, we got two super chats and one's a question directly for Jason. We'll start with this, though, from Always Balling 7. I said it on the postgame show last night. The guys read it, but the Cavs need a veteran vocal leader like P.J. Tucker, Pat Beverly, Draymond Green, etc. Who won't Not take Pat Beverly. Crap. Not Pat Beverly. <laughs> A player like that would be huge for the Cavs. And then Evan419 has a question directly for Jason. Jason, without saying the players like him, what is JB good at? He's been a coach since 2015. I think we know who he is. JB grew up in the NBA, first of all. So that's important. Like, he grew up around the game. His dad was a coach. He gets it. He understands it. He's good at coaching defense. They've had a really good defense the last couple of years. Now, I'll have a caveat to that in a minute, and I have ADD, so don't let me forget it. Okay. But – yeah, the players do like him. Yes, they respect him. And his offense, I didn't love the offense. I've said it all year. They're too pick-and-roll heavy. I don't see him running a ton of plays. They just run pick-and-roll, pick-and-roll, pick-and-roll. It's the first thing that gets taken away. But I don't think that we have a big enough record to say definitively he's not a good NBA coach. He doesn't know what he's doing. I didn't agree with all of his rotations. But listen, there's probably five elite coaches in the NBA, and there's five really bad coaches and everybody else is just sort of in the middle. And right now, to me, he's just sort of in the middle. And I don't think he's going to necessarily win you a series, but I don't think he's really going to lose you a series. And I think there's very few coaches out there who can really win you a series. Right. And I said this before. The Cavs made a lot of mistakes those first couple of years post-LeBron, a ton of mistakes. And they've been able to cover most of them and repair most of them and fix most of them. The one mistake that I think could haunt them was firing Ty. Ty and Kobe clashed badly yeah. after the championship, after LeBron left and all that. And it, it just felt like that was – Ty Lue is a postseason coach, and I know the Clippers lost. They had they lost their two top guys. What do yeah. you expect? Right. In a postseason series, Ty Lue can tie another team into knots. And that's what I want in a head coach. And that's the one mistake that I think they made early on that they may not be able to recover from. 
But having said that, I don't know that we know definitively yeah. who, t- who JB is. JB took over a really bad team. You know, in the interim coach, the Rockets were a mess when he got the interim chance. I thought he got screwed in Memphis. I thought he was a better coach and he deserved more of a chance there. Uh, here, you know, he took over for Beeline. The locker room was a mess. They hated Beeline. The team was a mess. So that's a lot of losses that get pinned on him. Uh, really, last year was the first time where he had a team that was ready to take a step, and they did. And this year, the 50-win team. I, I, I don't well, want both to com- years they lost when it mattered. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They lost uh, playing tournament games, yeah. and now they go out and get Donovan, and they lose in the first round. So I don't want to completely dismiss the regular season, but we've proven, and I've said a million times, the regular season is nothing like the postseason, and we saw that play out in the last couple of weeks. Two things. Number one, uh, number two is getting back to your caveat about his his defense. The defense, yeah. But real quick, I think your statement about five at the top, five at the bottom, I think that's actually in every sport. I think they're really – Probably. Maybe some of yours at six, some of yours whatever. That's probably true. But most of the coaches in most sports are somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Now, let's get back to what you said. There's a caveat about his defense. So, he's great at coaching defense, and they had a great defense this year. And defense isn't why – you know, everyone wants to scream about the rebounding, and it was an issue. You know, yes, it was. And – the guards can't be out rebounding your two bigs. But again, I, and last night's the exception. The Knicks shot the ball really well last night. But the first three losses, 99, 101, 102 points. If you're holding a team to 99, 101, 102 points, you should be winning those Especially games. Especially in this NBA. Yeah, the <laughs> defense is not why the Cavs lost this series. But I, would, I will say this. Like, I've talked to people around the league who say, like, you can have – you can't be the worst team defensively. I might have said this on the show the other day. You can't be the worst defensive team, like the absolute worst, and expect to win. But you don't have to be great defensively in the right. NBA. You can be mediocre to even bad. But if you have elite shooting, it's going to cover it. In today's NBA, you know, we used to say all the time, defense beats offense. You know, you can't right. say that anymore, especially in the NBA. If you have great shooting and bad defense, you can win. If you have elite defense and bad shooting, you're not going to win. And Same we thing saw in football. That. Same and thing we football. saw that. You got to have the offense. Yeah. Kevin. A mediocre to subpar so, defense. So, so what you're telling me as yeah. I as I take notes on this, so you have a mediocre coach you don't know much about. He's been somewhere in the middle. Um, you don't have a really top notch starting five. You have no bench. You have no assets. That you, about sums it up. You yeah. don't have any cap space. I think four of their five starters are pretty good. I think their starting five is is good. It's it's not the best, but it's good. Yeah. But the rest is fair. I mean, the coaches, middle of the road, it seems. I, 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 and I, the I, bench sucks. See, here's the thing with their with their starting four, like core four, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Like, when Miami first assembled a big three, when LeBron went there and they were the first one to really assemble this this super team of three max contracts and then a bunch of scrubs, well, those three max contracts were Hall of Famers. All three of them. Yeah. Hall of Famers. That's a little bit different. You can carry a little bit different, a, a, a weaker bottom half of the roster when right. you have three Hall of Famers. Yeah, Darius Garland may one day be in the Hall of Fame. I'm not ready to declare him a Hall of Famer. Evan Mobley may one day live yeah, up right. to the potential, but I'm not ready to declare that. Donovan Mitchell, same thing. So therefore, is not good enough to carry That's right. five through nine. That's right. Because they're not they're not the big three Hall of Fame style that we've seen work in the big three era. They are three monster superstars. Cavs aren't there yet with those I, guys. I, but well, here's the thing. I would I would say I would argue that Jared Allen. If you go, you want to look pick for pick, and you, you, guy for guy, Cavs don't got a Mario Chalmers on this team. They don't even have a Norris Cole. They sure as hell don't got no Udonis Haslam being gritty, tough. They don't got that. They don't have any. They don't have Jawan Howard. They don't have sharp shooting like Ray Allen coming off the bench. When you start to look about how these teams is is constructed, and we we have the we have the benefit of the doubt of finding and looking at the way that the Cavs won in 2016. This team is light years. I mean, it, it's not even in the same. It's not even the same ballpark. Like as far as and it's not just the top guys. It's the role guys. It's the Kyle Corvers. It's the you know the Kevin Love guys. The guys that the J.R. Smiths. You know Jay, how good even Jay- Delhi. They don't have the scrappy uh, Delhi guy. J.R. Smith on his team. Come on, J.R. Smith was a knockdown shooter. He played. He really guarded the, the best player on the opposite team defensively. This, I mean, think about that. Like they don't have anybody of so, that caliber. We're saying all this now. Like none of us were saying much of this. I guess you were. Some, well, some I was of these saying. Things. 
But most of us were living in La La Land thinking this team was going to be really good. Did we overrate the talent? Here's what we I tend to overrate our own players. Here's what I missed, and I yeah. should have known better, about the lane, playing two non-shooting bigs together. Yeah. I should have seen that coming. And I, and I just missed it. I just missed how that would play in the playoffs. Because to your point, G, in 2016, like, I don't think Mike Budenholz was a very good coach, and he's proven that again. But he was near – I think I've said this before. He was near tears on the podium in Atlanta. Oh, like, legitimately couldn't do despondent. Nothing. He just, had no idea what to do with the Cavs. When you have Kyrie and LeBron coming downhill, driving yeah. to the bucket, and you got Channing Fry over here, J.R. Smith over there, and Kevin Love back there, how are you supposed to stop that? You yeah. can't stop that. Right. And that's the way – to win and today when you have two ball dominant playmakers like they did then and like they do now that's how you win is you put three shooters on the floor with them and that's the part that I missed and I should have known that let's wrap up our Cavs conversation with Kevin Love you just mentioned Kevin Love there I think we I know I did Mm. say who cares get rid of Kevin Love we were convinced by the Cavaliers and by his play when they got rid when they took away his minutes that he was done. Clearly, he's not done. He's being used wisely by a great coach. Five threes last night. Was has had big games in the series, including last night. On the road. He has the championship. Closeout game. The championship DNA. Yep. He would have been the best outside shooter, you know, besides the big guys. They made a huge mistake. Who do you blame for that more, Kobe or JB? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take the easy way out. And I'm gonna blame I'm gonna blame Kevin and J- JB and Kobe. I'm gonna blame them all. Okay. Because Kevin, I I understand. Listen, it was a mistake. Like we can say it. We can definitively Obviously. say it with yeah, our chest. At this point, yeah. They made a mistake. And I think he had 15 points and seven rebounds last night. What do the Cavs need most right now? <laughs> Three point shooting and rebounding. That's what he gave Miami. He's a key rotational piece for them, and they got him for nothing. Yes. Now. I agree. I think Eric Spolster is the best coach in the NBA. I think Pat Riley is still a master at what he does. The way that they find talent and mind talent, develop it, they are the elite of the elite in the league. But from the Cavs' perspective, they were concerned. Like, Kevin was moody this year. We've seen Kevin be moody in the past. We've seen, even when he was playing, we've seen the outbursts. And they were concerned with with Kevin not playing. And, and at the moment, he was unplayable. What's it going to be like? in the locker room is he going to be a problem here's the thing good good solid sound leadership can fix this stuff and that's what they didn't do and they chose to just move on from him and they wanted to do right by him I do believe that he's meant so much to the organization he wanted a chance to play I've said it a million times he wanted another contract he thinks he could still play in the league he needed a chance to play he wasn't getting that chance here but some of his behaviors in the past, some of his behaviors this year, yeah. I understand why the Cavs felt like we can't have him around here if he's not playing because we know how this is going to go. So I get that from their side of things. But I also think bring it in and fix it with Kyrie. Bring it in and fix it. He says he wants out. He says, I will never play another minute with LeBron. Bring it in and fix it. And they didn't do that. And that's where I think if you have a Pat Riley type of figure in the organization, if you have someone who can lead, who can bring this in, have a conversation, try and patch this up. Kobe said, I will never play another minute with Shaq. Like he went on Stephen A. Smith and said, yeah. I will never play for the Lakers again. And what happened? And he did. They kept him. Yeah. And I just think that there's ways to try and mend the fences. But Kevin made it clear that he was done with the coaching staff. He wanted out and they granted his wish. And now you see what happens now. When they need him the most, he's delivering for Miami. Well, well, I, you know, I, I look at it like this. I talk about Stefanski all the time. I talk about coaches. Coaches now, they don't understand that it takes more to lead men than knowing what you're doing X's and O's. That is a small part of what your job is. Your job is a motivator. Your job is a guy that is supposed to put out fires. You're a guy that's supposed to be able to communicate very well in tough situations to get people to buy into what you're saying. The option can't always be fire people. People always say, well, G. Bush, you always talk about management and you talk about that thing. No, no, no. Management skills translate to anything you're doing. Management skills translate to whether you you manage the people who dig ditches or you manage the people who are flying airplanes or managing CIA agents. You have to have a certain level of rapport and a communication style that lends itself to people buying in. And when when people say, oh, it's rumblings, he's a little moody. That's life. 
everybody gonna be a little moody. Bull just told Mikey McNuggets in a nice way, shut the hell up. I'm got this. <laughs> That's right. Stop he talking to my ear, dog. I got it. Mikey wait, say, wait till I throw a 75. I, I'm waiting for him to say, <laughs> let's get the baseball. Right, let's, let's get, get to the Guardians. So, and look, I'm ready for it. And we so so at the end of the yeah. day, you know what happens? We all say, all right, listen, yeah, let's do you're it. Right. And keep it moving. That's right. I'm not gonna worry too much about mood because guess what? The collective will make sure that nothing bad happens. You're both you're both right. You're 100% right. You're 100% right. There's got to be a guy in that organization that says, I don't give a crap that you're unhappy. Here's what we're going to do, and we're going to keep playing. If you don't like it, tough, whatever. The Cavs don't have that. Here's the thing. Kevin Porter Jr. sent away. J.R. Smith sent away. Andre Drummond sent away. Kevin Love sent away. Kyrie Irving sent away. And, and I understand the philosophy of we, we want, if you don't want to be here, we don't want you here. We only want guys who want to be here. Well, this is Cleveland in the wintertime. It's hard to find guys. Suck it up. It's That's hard right. to find guys who really want to be here. Yeah. Uh, and I just think, in, in some of those, I get why the guys were sent away. And in some of those, I think that there's paths to mend the relationship that weren't. Explored. And they haven't done a good job figuring out when they can do that. Yeah. All right. Great hour conversation about the Cavs. We'll do some more NBA later when we talk about some of the other series. We're gonna in a moment switch gears and talk some Guardians. But first, let's talk to Mikey McNuggets. It is 12 o'clock on the dot. Bull, you are just flexing on us today. You are the host extraordinaire. I can't get anything past you, Jason. <laughs> Jason, what did I text Touché. you this morning, by the way? I ain't going to repeat it on air, but I texted Jason some this morning. Some psychological warfare. Bull played right into it. I appreciate it, Bull. I'll show Touché. you what I said, Jason, afterwards. But it is 12 o'clock, which means it is time for the lunch hour of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. And as always, the lunch hour is sponsored by Call of Gracing, the official NASCAR team of Northeast Ohio. We want to thank everybody who tuned into the post-game shows for the Cavs games. We had over 1,000 people in there last time. We got over 1,000 people watching now. You guys are the true MVPs, and I want to give two special shout-outs to Evan419 and Phil Bowman. They both gifted five memberships each nice. to people in the chat today, so 10 gifted memberships. Like you that. guys are awesome. We appreciate you guys, and if you weren't gifted a membership and want to get your own, well... Here are two options for you. For a buck ninety nine a month, you can become a starters tier member that gets you loyalty badges, custom emojis, members only community posts, and then for four ninety nine, the big baller tier. It is the coaches tier. You get all those same starter tier perks, plus daily overtime videos, member shout outs, discount codes for merch, much, much more. Depending on how the rest of the show goes, we'll be talking about Giannis and participation trophies potentially with his comments after the Bucks loss to the Heat last night. A lot to get to. We appreciate you guys for gifting memberships. And with that, we may not have the Cavs, but we do yeah. have. We will get to the Guardians just a second. Biden. I got to do uh, a few shout outs, including one that's really important. I want to say a, a special shout out to, to every butcher. What's that? To your butcher? Shout out no. to butcher. Yeah, shout out to now my man. Now you guys man. are going to be embarrassed because I'm doing something serious and you're going to feel bad that you just said that. So I'm going to do a shout out to everybody at University Hospital Seidman Cancer Center uh, that's been working with my wife. My wife, for those who don't know, has leukemia. Um, she received, she's been. Uh, doing chemo for a couple of years. We thought we were past the worst of it. And uh, unfortunately, they had to take another step and she had to have a bone marrow of what's now called the stem cell transplant. She had the transplant done Tuesday uh, and uh, it, it went great. Uh, obviously, we, you know, if, if, whether it's going to work long term, we won't know for a while. But so far, so good. Uh, she's doing great. She was actually doing laps around the hospital floor today. And so, all, especially our, our doctor, Dr. Ben Tomlinson's a great guy, but really it's the nurses, the amazing nurses that mm. don't get their due. The doctors are, you know, the big shots, but the nurses, all over, all the nurses that take care of people, it's amazing, but specifically to the, to the nurses that work on the third floor of the Seidman Cancer Center with very serious disease there, leukemia and, and lymphoma and stuff like that. And a shout out specifically, and I hope I don't forget any names, to Chase, to Matt, to Julie, to um, Nina, to, uh, I'm forgetting names, but uh, there, there's so many amazing nurses that have, you know, helped my wife. They take care of her. They treat her like gold. They're so amazing. They do an incredible job. And folks, people ask me all the time, friends, family, whatever, what can I do? What can I do? And I appreciate all the offers. People that offer me meals and this and that. Can I do it? I have such a great community, and I love all the people here, and it's so special. It means so meaningful to me. I, what I will ask everybody out there to do, and I'm going to ask everybody out there to do going forward, donate blood if you can. Donate platelets. Uh, do the testing for 
stem cells and bone marrow to see if you could potentially be a donor for someone, especially if you're young. If you're listening and you're in your 20s, something like that, you could save a life. So please do what you can. All right. So be the match, go. right? Be the What's match. Be the match. Yeah, please. And, and again, the people at Sidemen, they do just incredible work. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. On a much less serious note, let's talk about the Guardians. Tanner Bybee yesterday. Your favorite Guardian of all time. I know. I was Bull has been obsessed with obsessed. Tanner Bybee. I mean, I might have started first. I yeah. might have started from the beginning. Yeah. No, G. Bush, you can't bring him up like that. Yeah. You got to baby him. No, I see some video on him. I like him. Bring him up here. And now he is the right-handed version of Randy Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> he wears Rex specs, too, which makes him 10 times cooler. Yes. Like 10 and, times cooler. And I know, Jason, you know, we thought, like, he wouldn't be up for a while. And I love that the Guardians are like, Hey, our pitching is not good enough. Yeah. We got to be aggressive right here. Now, I know Francona said there's no guarantee he's staying in the rotation. Oh, he's staying in the rotation. But no. he's got to stay in the rotation, he's right? Stay, he said they're going to keep him up and, yeah. and figure it out as they go. But Now, if he starts getting blown up, right. maybe they'll change their mind. But the first starts for Allen and Bybee, who are two of their better pitching prospects. And Bybee's higher on the list than Allen. Much higher. But, but, they're, but Allen's still a good pitching prospect, too. It's one start. And it was against the Rockies yesterday. You don't right. want to get carried away. Well, he was very impressive. His next start's going to be in New York. So, good. Hold, hold on to your butts. Throw him in the fire. I agree. I Love agree. it. I agree. Like, yeah. Start him out against a triple-A team in the Rockies. Yeah. Let him get some confidence. Yeah. Let him go get his nipples ripped off against the Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funniest thing you said. That's the funniest thing you've ever said oh, in your life. Oh, my God. And, and, and then see how he handles a little adversity, right? Uh, but, no, I've been, uh, I've been really high on Bybee. Yeah. Uh, we've, been, we've been monitoring every start he's made. I mentioned yeah. the bull. A few weeks ago, that Bybee, Bybee's ahead of Gavin Williams yeah. and Bull's eyes lit up. And he has been obsessed with Tanner obsessed. Bybee ever since. Yeah. Dude Ooh. throws nine. Now, he looks like an accountant, and he throws 98. <laughs> look he at is the, the most unassuming. I mean, look at the movement. Look at that thing. I mean, that look is at that, nasty. Look at, look at that thing fall off the he's table. He's got like an that. incredible changeup, wipeout slider. Like, he's he's a four-pitch pitcher. Yeah. He, can, he can get guys out with all four pitches. He's a big guy. I mean, he's he, not like – he's kind of he thick. Is, yeah, a little bit. I, I don't know about no, that. I mean, I'm not, I mean hey, I, pause. Super I mean, pause. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, <laughs> he looks for a children. <laughs> I I work with children here. <laughs> Jason, for a pitcher, he likes he's put together. He's, you know, he's well, like well, what's interesting with him? Anyway. So I went to the game. Yeah, yeah. I want to see him pitch. Yeah. So I went to the game prior to the Cavs game. Okay. So I was watching with Meisel, and I'll tell you, his first pitch, we both said like, "Geez, like his his delivery is a little bit violent." And when the ball came out, I was like, that was 106 miles an hour. And we looked up the scoreboard, it was 94. I'm like, how is that possible? Yeah. It looks so much harder than, when, than what the gun registered, but he got it up to 97, 98. Well, man, I'll tell you, man. there are some pitchers that look like they're throwing harder than they are. And again, it's one start, but that's the way it, that was the first time I'd ever, because I'd seen the highlights from the minors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and obviously, I've been obsessively following him. Yeah. Yes. But I had seen him pitch a whole game. And. You're right. I'm watching it on TV, and I'm like, that looks harder than that. It, it looked and, like oh. 106 coming out of his hand. And really what did. I really loved is every ball. I mean, you don't know where – like, the ball, he's got such good movement on all his pitches. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm excited. I mean – What do you mean you excited? And I, Gavin Williams, they just promoted him to AAA. Gavin Williams took Bybee's place in the, in the rotation. He'll be, up, he'll be up by May, he'll be, possibly. He'll be up by <laughs> June 1st. At yeah. And you know what? And I was talking to Zach yesterday. Yeah. That's a good thing because, like, we've talked about it before. They, they're they going to have to make some moves at the deadline. They yeah. have everything they need to go get whatever it is they want. Yeah. And also, they need to see, are these guys ready or not? By yes. bringing them up now, you know, and by July 31st, who do we need to get? Do we need to go get a starter? Right. Is Gavin Williams and Tanner, Tanner Bybee, are they ready to hold spots in postseason rotations? That's right. a lot to ask of rookies. That's right. But now you're going to get enough of a track record now to see what you need in July. Do we need a bat? Do we need an arm? Do we need both? Mm. Do we need a front of the rotation guy? Do we need a right fielder? What do we need to get? What do we need to focus our – allocate our, our assets to? If you wait till middle of June, end of June to bring these guys up, you may not have those answers. That's right. And, you know, we're all, all – you know, I, I'm mostly complimentary as you are of the guard. Guardians. My only criticism of them ever, pretty much, is when they don't spend money, yeah. at, or they slow down a guy's call up to the majors to stop to, to get him the seventh year. They didn't do it with Quan. Yep. They haven't done it with Bybee. They haven't done it with Allen this year. Yeah. It's good to see. I like that. It's like, hey, and, and first of all, the division sucks. 
Yeah. Like, we know the Royals and Tigers Nobody's are going to be good. This the White Sox are a White total Sox disaster. Are a disaster. The Twins are fine, and they're, you know, they're all right. They don't scare but they're me. They're not all. running away with anything. No. This is their division to win, and they could. They could have just said, you know what, we're fine. Let's be patient for a while. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that. And I like that. that they've been aggressive with the, with the pick. If you're, not, if you're not going to use the money or you're not going to go out and use the assets to go get better players, um, veterans that can help you now. Yeah. I've always thought, like, just bring them Let's up go. and see, see, what they got. see what they got. Because here's the thing. As a guy who's now I'm watching every one of his starts. Cause, cause now I can fi- I didn't follow them. Yeah. I didn't got into my YouTube time machine. I'm like, this dude is filthy, bro. I can't wait to see him up yeah. here. And now, guess what? Now the fans are like, oh, I, I like this young dude. At least I can dream and under That's I, right. and, and figure out whether or not this guy gonna be a part of the rotation. Be- I love it because overall the Guardians not playing that great. No, their not. lineup right now is a mess. Yeah. nobody like nobody's really hitting. Right. You, th- uh, you think you like Bobby? Wait till you see Gavin Williams. I, well, Zach said, Meisel told me that yeah. he's a clone of Garrett Cole in terms of his delivery. Big guy. He's a big guy. Well, Bobby's of, delivery yeah. looks just like Verlander. Whoa, that's Almost it. to Whoa. a team. Yeah. Yeah, well, right. Daniel like Espino was supposed to be the best of them all. And he can't stay healthy. He can't stay on the field. So, so, you, Garrett Cole is Garrett Cole is well, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. call him Garrett Cole. <laughs> that, yeah. I'm, saying the, I'm saying the delivery uh, and but, the machination. Yeah, yeah. But if he's, if he's 75% of Cole... Uh, I'll take it. But here's what's interesting. And listen, it's a long year. We know yeah. injuries are going to play a part in this. And you never know how this is going to shake out. But I, I don't know how you're going to find five guys because, okay, you got and, – and by the way, Shane's – no one's really talking about this. Shane's getting hit around a little bit right now. No, we've we been talking, talking about, about it. it. Oh, have you? Yeah. Guys, 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 yeah, I don't like the way he's pitching. We, no, we, no. Have, no. A, we have a little bit of a breaking news. We do? Breaking news. This is kind of um, – Pioneer – and uh, former Cincinnati mayor Jerry Springer has died. 79 years old. Oh, that old. happened this morning, yeah. 79 years of age. Jerry Springer. Jerry wow. Springer's. Jerry. I, I Jerry. didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, did, hey, before you get back to the yeah. point, Steve, take tag board full, play the video. Tell me this is not, I saw this on Twitter, but this is identical. This is Verlander and uh, Bobby's. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Good. Who, wow. Who, who Where did, did that? Bobby grow up? California. West oh, Coast okay. guy. So he's not like he grew up in Detroit watching Verlander. But it is pretty identical. And you're right. Gavin Williams' uh, wind-up looks almost identical to Garrett Cole. We'll have to do a side-by-side when he makes right, his Nice job by well, Matt Milner, whoever uh, that is. That's crazy. I don't know how to do those side-by-side videos. I have no clue how to do that. I'm so technologi- nah, technologically no inept. But anyway. That so, was a good side-by-side, yeah. So, for now, like, like, again, this is the problem with Bieber throwing 92. The margin for error for him is so yeah. is so thin. He's getting hit around right now. Wh- whatever. He's still your lead pitcher yeah. for now. You have him, Quantrill. Uh, Quantrill's so, been terrible. I know. But, terrible. And, yeah. and Tito said, like, well, they know he's awful early, and he yeah. sort of straightens himself out. Savali, when he's healthy, say what you want about him. Um, and then you've got Bybee, Logan Allen. If Gavin Williams comes Eventually up. Eventually McKenzie. McKenzie. Yeah. I, I knew I was forgetting one. And you still so, got police sack, although I know Plesak's you and I said going to the put bullpen. him in the I think he's going to the bullpen. Yeah. So, I don't know how you fit seven into five. And Gavin's not here yet, so let's remove him. Right, so, right. six. McKenzie will be back at the end of May. So, how you get six into five, you know, I don't know how they're going to uh, juggle this. But just something to keep an eye on. And, and, you know, I was talking to Zach yesterday. I just wonder how guys like Quantrill and Plesak feel when they see Bybee coming and they know Gavin Williams is, is behind yeah. them. I just wonder in the clubhouse. What, what, I mean, guys are competitive. They want to compete. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah, just interesting. I, it's fascinating. And another thing by seeing these guys up, and, and if we see if we end up seeing Allen and Bybee for the whole year at this point, and, and maybe Gavin Williams for three, four months, is that if you do tr- – because, we you know, we talk the uncomfortable conversations about yeah. Donovan Mitchell getting traded at some yeah. point. Shane Bieber's getting traded this offseason. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. there's just no way around that. They're, no. They're not, they're not in the business. Like, they may let Rosario walk because – you're not getting a ton back from him in a trade anyway. Right. Shane Bieber is not walking. No. He's so not. they're trading him this offseason. But he's it's, also it's, getting it's, hit around a little bit too much for true for value's sake true. right now. But you're Hopefully right. Hopefully he straightens that out. Yes, I think he, I, I think he will. But uh, I think he will too. For the and he hasn't been terrible. No. But he's but he's not been great. Right. Not been I, th- I think expect. he will figure it out. But if these guys come up and pitch well, well then you even feel better about like okay we can trade Bieber and get you know whatever. Hey, and, after what they got for Lindor with one year of control left. Yeah. It's right. incredible what they got for him. And again, I've said this before. Go back and look at what the Orioles got for Manny Machado. They got nothing, nothing. for Machado. Yeah. And the the Guardians got a, a player who's every bit as good as Frankie and Andres Jimenez. Yes. And 
Rosario, another piece in Rosario. Yeah, absolutely. Terrific so, trade. Uh, yeah, they did, and they'll probably do the same for Bieber. For Go Bieber. ahead, Mike. <laughs> It is 12.15, which means it is time to remind everybody that the Lunch Hour of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show is sponsored by Colleague Racing, the official NASCAR team of Northeast Ohio. And we got to spend a few minutes on the big sporting event happening tonight before we welcome Terrell Brandon to the show. The NFL Draft, which is a little different than normal yeah. because the Browns don't have a first-round pick, but we will still talk about it because it is important because our good friends at Lincoln Electric are sponsoring a Browns Talk segment every day. Lincoln Electric, hiring for all great jobs in the welding and manufacturing field. Check them out. Great people, great jobs, Lincoln Electric. My question for you guys, the Browns don't have a first-round pick tonight. How much and where would you put on a scale of 1 to 10 is your interest in what happens in the first round of the draft tonight? Well, I, I'll tell you, and it's it's so funny because it's a it's the day of the draft in Cleveland, and an hour, 15 minutes into the show, we're just like, oh, yeah, the draft. The draft. Like, yeah, usually, oh. for how many years was the draft the Christmas Super Bowl. here? That was Super it. Bowl, Christmas, whatever you want to call it. And now it's like irrelevant because, and even if the Browns had a first round pick, we'd be talking about it more, obviously. But you know they're they're not looking for a quarterback right now, so it's a different thing. However, you know I'm interested because I just like the draft. Mm -hmm. I hate the lead up to the draft and the mock drafts. Yeah. I find that stuff now so tiring and boring. But I, I like. I, I kind of feel yeah, I'm just, just like, a little bit too, right. I'm like, so done with all these because everybody's a genius now with their mock draft. But I like the actual draft, and I like, I'm like. i interested to see where players go. Selfishly for me, I'm interested to see what the Bengals do with their late first-round pick. Could they take Jamar Gibbs, a running back? Uh, could they go with a tight end? So I'm curious to them. And I am interested to see what the Steelers do and what the Ravens do. The Steelers end up getting Joey Porter Jr., which would be quite yeah. fascinating if that happens. So I'm into it, but, I mean, from a Browns perspective, it, I, I mean, we're all going to be stunned beyond belief if they end up trading back no. into the first round. 0.0%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, That's from happening. a Browns perspective, obviously there's no interest, but I have interest in the draft tonight. Do you? Yeah, I'm going to watch. Um, yeah. I, it'll be like, you know, now what I do is because the Browns have not had really draft picks like that for a while. Yeah. Because remember a couple of years ago, they didn't have a first round pick for, uh, with Odell Beckham Jr. Right. trade. Yep. So now you, you go back with the Deshaun Watson trade. So what I usually do is put it on and kind of see the, the movement. I'm, I'm interested in seeing which teams really feel like they're a couple pieces away. Because right. you could tell, like, guys, and, and my dad said this the other day. He said, look, after this crop of people, like, after this crop of guys, because there might be four quarterbacks, he said, are there any teams that will need quarterbacks after that? Think about it. Everybody seems to have found something. Like, even the, the Jets got uh, Aaron Rodgers. Yep. Um, the only guy I could think is if Russell Wilson plays horribly again. But a after these teams go out and draft Stroud or draft Bryce Young, and then you got Will Levis and Richardson, that's four more quarterbacks off the board. What other teams need quarterbacks? I, I think there's always going to be injuries. There's always going to be guys that don't meet expectations. There's always going to be, just when you think all the holes are plugged, yeah. another one springs, another one sprouts. That's true. Somebody plays terrible. Like, you're yeah. like, oh, well, he's going to turn the corner, and then you're like, oh, goodness, he's terrible. Like, yeah. I, I see that happening like Geno Smith. Geno Smith had a nice year. If he plays terrible, the Seattle Seahawks will have no problem right. being like, mm. And Tennessee, who's Tennessee have? Um, Ryan Tannehill, baby, yeah. former Aggie wide receiver. And Malik, and then Malik, and then Malik. Uh, Malik. Gig But we have no idea if he's any I don't good even know if he's decent. So there's always going to be teams that, so, and Tua could get another concussion and be done. Like, there's always teams that you think you're good and then suddenly you're not good. Right. My interest level on in the NFL draft tonight is probably one and three quarters. Like I'll have it on. I have two TVs in the office. I'll have one of them on the draft, but I'll have the other one on. I mean, the guardians are off tonight. There's no, the Celtics Hawks doesn't do a lot for me. No. I'm not really interested in that series, but I'll probably have that on. But the fact that there's no other compelling TV on is the only reason I watch the draft. I, I truly, I don't really care. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and you know, it's ironic because the Browns, for so many years, that was what we were hanging our hat on. That was, that was all it. we had. Yep. Yeah. Now it's like we're not even going to do nothing in day one or day two. Like, cause well, I, day two they have picks. They have, but it's like you got to wait. You got to still wait a while unless they trade. Day two, I could see them trading up to the second round, possibly. possibly. I think that's a possibility. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. Don't worry. What's that? We're going to talk about the Browns' plans for day two tomorrow. We think it, no way they're making it uh, into round one. By the way, Gavin Williams today in AAA, four innings pitch, no runs, five strikeouts, electric stuff. And Jason, you you're go. right. His windup and Garrett Cole, eerily similar. So, 
With that being said, we're going to do a real quick round of uh, happy face, sad face, yes or no on some NFL draft prop bets. Okay. We're going to run through these real quick. we got ten of them, so we're going to run through them. Hopefully, throw Brandon joins us at 1230. If not, we got plenty of other stuff to get to. Are you guys ready for a round of happy face, sad face? Okay. A.K.A. Me. yes happy or no, face, would you take face. it or not on some NFL draft prop bets? You ready? ready. Question number one, over under four and a half quarterbacks taken in the first round tonight. Hmm? So if you think it's over, give me a happy face. If you think it's under, give me a sad face. Hendon Hooker is the fifth, who may or may not go in the first round. I'll Everyone say, says no. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be four on the dot. Um, Hendon Hooker, I think, is a second-round pick. Um, the funny thing is somebody was talking about, I think we had a draft guy on here. He said the problem with Hendon Hooker is, he only had one good year of production at Tennessee, Virginia Tech. He wasn't the same guy. He's already 25. He just come off the ACL, so you right. might get to a point. He's 26 before. All of a sudden, he's Brandon Wee. <laughs> You're 26 yeah. before you even get a look at the man. Yeah, no, nobody's taking him in the first round. All right, next one. I don't know. I mean, I would never say never, but yeah, I, agree. I mean, I don't. Who knows? We're all. We're, this is all a guess. But this is all a guess. And these like, are all likely. per yeah. Fanduel, by the way. Over under one and a half running backs taken tonight in the first round. Bijan's a certainty. Will Jameer Gibbs be the second? Bull says yes. Jason says no. Nope. G says no. B- no. B- I, I, could, I think there's a good chance the Bengals would take Jameer Gibbs in the first round. Even though they haven't taken a running back in the first round in about 20 years. When's the last running back they did? Kajana Carter? Is that the last running back they took I, I in the think first he was round? the second to last. They took somebody a couple of years after him. Uh, I can't remember who it is, though. Whatever. All right, next one. Over under three and a half wide receivers. Taken in the first round tonight. Oh, they always go higher than yep. expected. Three Something yeses. Like yep. Yeah. yeah. Next one, Steve. Yep. Over under five and a half DBs, I, safeties, and cornerbacks. Who the hell knows? <laughs> I, I say yes because of the importance of the position. Yeah. I think I think I think there will be four DBs, no safeties though. I don't got no safeties going in the first round, so I'm gonna go right at five. So you're under. Yeah. All right. All right. Next one, Steve. Bijan Robinson's draft position. Does he go in picks one through twelve or in thirteen or after? Under. I think he in the mid twenties. He's not okay. gonna be no top twelve pick. Jason's paid, giving us both. I've paid no attention. I mean I don't know. I don't really know, but I <laughs> I find it hard to believe a running back's gonna go in the top ten picks, top twelve. No, nah, he's not gonna do that. Stop. Perfect. Man. Those teams are so desperate that I, I can't see them taking a running back that early. Next one. Especially when you think how many quarterbacks are gonna go. Yeah. Jackson slots. Smith and Jigba, same draft position. Before 12 or after 12? After. after. I think he's a late first rounder. I think he's a first rounder, but I think he's mid to late. 19 to 23 range. Okay, next up. I think we got two more. Nolan Smith, the defensive end from Georgia, who ran a 4 3 at the combine. By the way, before you said the defensive end from Georgia, I had no clue who he was. <laughs> right. Not a clue. He ran a 4 3 at the combine, two time national champion. I can't draft a defensive lineman with glasses. No offense, G. <laughs> what a shot. What a shot. That was a good one. I used to have a comeback. I don't have one. I love G speechless yeah, for the first like, time ever. They, they snuck that one in good. Um, no. He, he, he's going to be about 13, 14. I don't, there's too many quarterbacks going in the first. He kind of looks picks. nerdy, too. I can't. He looks a little nerdy. And he does not have that <laughs> level of production. Um, he don't have it ain't like he's one of them dudes that look really great, but can get locked up because they don't have no moves. Mm. So uh, by the way, I'm answering this and I think Jason kind of is also without being as obvious as me, like the people who picked the NCAA tournament based on uniforms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's basically I'm picking it yeah. based on uh, defensive linemen and quarterbacks seem to go the most. Yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. All right. Give me a yes. Uh, I've, done, have... I've done zero prep on the NFL no, draft. No, and with that, we're going to be sending out tech shorts and updating you on every pick the Browns oh, make all my in-depth throughout analysis the weekend. As you out. can tell, Bull, Jason, G, they are up to date oh, on yeah. everything you need to know about the NFL draft. Right. If you think they don't know first-round prospects, wait to hear them give their takes on the fifth and sixth-round guys. <laughs> well, G the might Browns know. take. I, uh, it is going to be electric. Board. Make sure you are part of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Members or not, this content is all free for you on our YouTube page, on our YouTube channel. On the Haymarket text chain, you're going to get it all. Make sure you tune in through us throughout the weekend. We got three more real quick. Boy, I know you know this guy because you mentioned him. Joey Porter Jr., top yeah. 20 pick or not? Where are the Steelers picking? That's what I was going to say. Where are the Steelers uh, picking? 
that's a great question. I think 19 or 18. They didn't make the playoffs, so they have to be. Yeah, yeah. Give so me a yes. I'm saying yes because I think the Steelers will draft him. That'd be cool if they do. I think he's the third corner on the big board. Um, I think he goes a little later than that. 26, 27. Okay. Two more. Will Tyree Wilson be the first defensive player taken? He is the prohibited favorite as of this morning. That's stupid. Hey, where's Jalen Carter projected to go now? That's dumb. I don't know. Top 10. He said the Eagles have assured him he will not fall past 10. So there's no chance they've assured him that. This this dude. He didn't do any interviews outside the top. Ty, Tyree Wilson is is cool, but he's not. He's not. Oh boy. He's so not you know him. what's crazy about you know what's crazy about Tyree Wilson? He was at A and M for two years when I was there. He couldn't get off the third string at A and M on the defensive line. And wow. He goes to Texas Tech, blows up, and now he's a projected top five. I, top I didn't know pick. they played any defense in the Big Ten. No. Oh Absolutely. wait, great trivia question. Yeah. Earl did not know this earlier. Last Big Ten or Big Twelve? Excuse me, Big Twelve. Defensive player to be drafted in the top 10. Who is it? And I wouldn't ask if it didn't have some sort of tie to Cleveland in this show. Brian Bosworth. Miles Garrett. No. A&M was the SEC at that point. Oh. Um, hold on. Brian Bosworth. <laughs> it's a great guess, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. You said, you said it, the last Big 12? Big 12 defensive player to go Danny top 10. Danny Shelton. No, I wasn't top 10. To go no, top no. 10. Oh, I just, I just hit um, myself not, right. It's not that, by the that way, far back. I just hit myself right in the nuts. With, with this Justin Gilbert. Yes, sir. There you go. Justin oh, Gilbert, the rocks. last Big 12 defensive player oh, to go in the top 10. God. Last one, Steve. Justin Gilbert? Yes. Yes. That guy was a total piece of garbage. No offense. He, we, he's, he's probably one of the best. Sorry, Mrs. Gilbert. Trash. Bust of all time. <laughs> your your his, son was trash. They drafted his him and Johnny Manziel his, in the his same play, first His play on the field was yes. trash. He might be a decent human being, or he might be a crappy human being, too. I don't know. But they drafted him and Johnny Manziel. Can you imagine two first-round picks, and you took those two bums? I mean, they, they, they've they whiffed on. Yeah. Johnny Manziel I mean, is a piece of trash. I, on I, and off I, the I mean, but the Trent Richardson whiffs. <laughs> to and then they traded him for a first round pick, and then they whiffed on that, and that was the pick they used to draft Danny, Johnny, right? Danny Shelton and Danny Cam, Shelton. Cam Irving in the same draft. You drafted a nose tackle in a Cam center. Irving. <laughs> Jesus. Anyway. All right, last one. Oh, Very last one. one. A guy I'm sure Bull has never heard of. Cedric Tillman. Will he be a first round Didn't pick? Didn't he play basketball for Texas AM in the eighties? This Cedric Tillman, no, maybe there's another one. I know a dude from the block, his name is BJ Tillman. Shout out to him. Y'all don't know. I Spencer thought, Tillman. He I thought Cedric player. Tillman played for the Grizzlies. I Basketball thought I saw him grabbing a rebound the other night. By the way. Xavier Tillman. Oh, Xavier. Cedric, Cedric Tillman. Hey, is, hey, Terrell Brandon's calling me. Hold on. You guys talk for a second. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the high-level <laughs> stuff we're doing here, folks. <laughs> We've devolved. Hey, I got to take this Terrell call. Terrell Brandon's calling me. Hey, I hit your back. Is, is, Cedric, is, Mikey gonna admit that right? yeah. is Mikey going to admit to him that he was calling him Brandon Terrell all morning? What do you think, Bush G? Bushy. I was confused. I said, is That's he an his actor? rap name, Bushy. <laughs> I thought he was like somebody off a Netflix special. I'm like, Brandon Terrell, that, like, that's crazy. Like, like yeah. He's, oh, like, yeah he's, well, well, anyway, yeah. I, I am, despite the fact that I've been making fun of it and don't, uh, you know, these guys, I don't know most of these guys, I am actually looking forward to it. So, uh, I, Jason said you're not. I'm not. I'll have it on. on. Like, whatever. Right, I got yeah. to do four hours of radio tomorrow, so I got to watch it. I, who are you filling in for? Lima. So, me and Ken tomorrow morning. Lima still uh, in the building? He's in New York. He's going to New York mm-hmm. with uh, with the wife to celebrate the honeymoon. First year. Oh, really? Is it first year? Yeah. It's I got to call Lima. This is like some odd things going on. Yeah. Right? I got I to gotta reach out. Me and Jason are on the uh, schedule a lot. <laughs> 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 anyway, Shout, but I did hear, uh, hear him at the Cleveland. Shout but out to there Lyman. could be some, you know, again, some veteran movement that we could see today. Mm-hmm. Could see mentioned this yesterday. DeAndre Hopkins could get traded. Yep. Buda Baker could get traded. Uh, Dalvin Cook. There's been rumors about him getting traded. Anybody on the Browns radar? Uh, would you like? Before we were really hot and heavy about DeAndre Hopkins. There was a yeah, lot. Yeah, I, yeah, I they, think the Browns are done making trades for veterans. Yeah. They don't have, you know, they're not giving up. I mean, they don't, I think I, again, they have two thirds, two fourths, two fifths. So, and I'm not going to be here tomorrow, but, but um, I'm expecting them to package some of those picks to potentially, if there's a guy they like mid second round, late second round, or even earlier in the third round, 
it would it might make some sense to, to target them with some extra picks. Zach Jackson noticed that they I think they've moved around in the fourth round every year. Yeah, that Barry's been here. So I do think that they're going to move around the board. They could go up. They could move a pick for next year. They could trade one of these picks for an extra three or four next year. Yeah, but I do think they'll be active. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because but even tomorrow, even though I won't be here, uh, I don't know who's on who's on who's on tomorrow with uh, Brad. I think it's you, Brad, Jason. No, uh, I'm not in. Oh, Jay. Is Brad Jay? came in this morning thinking yeah. he was on. The yeah, floor. I see. Him. Is Brad in tomorrow with Jay and G? Brad's in tomorrow. It's, it's Jay, Brad, and G tomorrow. Okay, so but even like the Browns won't have ma- still will not have made any picks, obviously, and it'll all be over the weekend. So Monday show uh, will be a big one. I think it's probably me, you, and Jay on Monday, uh, but that'll be a big show because we'll be recapping all of the Browns draft picks because wouldn't have had any time to talk about them during the week. All right, Mikey, do we have Terrell Brandon? He's setting up. Give us one more second. But while we set up, I'll remind everybody that yeah. the lunch hour of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show is sponsored by Colleague Racing, the official NASCAR team of Northeast Ohio. And with that, let's welcome on Terrell Brandon, former Cavs guard, legend, shooting extraordinaire to the show. We figured out the tech issues, and now here's there our guy he from is. California. What's up, Terrell? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing, man? Terrell, well, we'd be doing better if the Cavs hadn't played like such garbage for the last uh, week. Were you were you surprised how poorly they played against the Knicks? Yeah, I'm a little disappointed. Um, I think it's a it's a great learning experience uh, for us, though, because um, you know with Donovan coming in for the first time and uh, getting his feet wet, it was good to see him um, injury free during the playoffs. Because I know if he's had some some challenges in Utah in the past. And then our big man, I think that, you know, that, that was some great experience for our big man to, and Allen and Mobley to be able to get that experience. Um, naturally, he may have to get in the weight room a little bit, but yeah. um, overall, I think, you know, with Garland and everybody, keep everybody together, keep your spirits up. We have a great coach, uh, but, you know, we have some work to do. Terrell, do you follow the Cavs closely? And I guess you played for a couple teams, Minnesota, right? Cleveland, who do you most identify with in your playing time? Um, well, personally, I'm, I'm a Cavalier to my heart. And so uh, <laughs> that will never change. I think it depends on how old you are. Uh, some people, you know, who are younger see me as more of a, a Timberwolf to some. Uh, and, and my time in Milwaukee was just very brief, only yeah. a year and some change. But uh, my years, you know, it's like your first kiss. I'm a, I'm a Cleveland Cavalier, and uh, that's what most people look at me as. You know, Terrell, like, I, I remember, you know, it was a weird era, like uh, the, the Cavs era where, you know, they go to Gund Arena, right? They got the cream sickle uniform. See, a lot of people don't like them. Listen, to me, I love the cream sickle uniform. Oh, Y'all, that I was crazy. Him. I got a shooting shirt. I said, listen, I got to get that off. I like, like him, too. I like I'm those, man. Um, you all came, you came up after Mark Price, and it was crazy because, you know, you we had Price and, you know, we had Elo and Doherty and all those guys, and then you was kind of the second generation of point guard, and I, I just remember when you was playing in, in that time period going against the Bulls and some of those other teams, it was like you became the guy. Like, you, you just... It's just like, okay, Terrell Brandon is guy. You made an all-star team. How, how was that trying to make your, your stamp on the roster after some of the, the glory days, the 80s, and, and, and moving into the, uh, into the 90s? I mean, that's a perfect question. I love that. Uh, coming into, um, you know, I got drafted in 91, and it was, it was intimidating. You know, you have Mark Price, Larry Nance, Brad Doherty, John Hot Rod Williams, Winston Bennett. Craig Elo, John Battle, <laughs> Coach Steve Kerr, you know, all these veterans. And and um, I'm trying to figure out how exactly I'm going to fit in. And uh, Coach Lenny Wilkins, he really gave me the blueprint early on. It was like, what you did in college was nice, but coming here, this is what I want. I want you to look at the uh, the, the, the score. And when if, if we're up five points, then when I take you out, I want to be up at least five points. It wasn't about how many points I scored in that quarter. So he taught me about possessions. He taught me about being a pro. And once I got my opportunity, you know, trying to replace Mark Price, it was not easy. You know, from the fans' perspective, you know, Mark Price was, he's a great. And so uh, Coach Coach Mark, uh, 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 excuse me, Coach uh, 
Mike Fratello and uh, Mr. Wayne Emery, they saw something in me and, and felt like I was ready. And I uh, got my opportunity. And once I made the All-Star team that first year, mm -hmm. I got my opportunity. I think that's when the media and the, the, the fans, they really embraced me and said, okay, this this little kid ready. And I, and I, it was, yeah, yeah. And, and, and everybody saw me when I came up. I wasn't, uh, I didn't get traded. So I came in as a young buck and was behind Mark Price every year showing what I could do, trying to be the best backup point guard in the league. Bro, you, um, when you did get traded, and that was like a, it was like a 10 player trade or whatever, Sean Kemp, and obviously there's a lot of guys involved in that trade. What was your, like at the time, what was your reaction to it? What did, what were you thinking? Because you had been an all-star, you know? I was hurt. I was hurt. I was hurt. I got the call, and I had been going to work out the gun arena that's coming from Richfield, so I know all the tradition. I'm going through it, and I'm going through my seventh year in the league, and I get a call, and it says, uh, Terrell, this is Wayne, and I have a friend and a family member in Cleveland, Wayne Bender. So I said, well, what's up, Wayne? What's going on? And he said, no, this is Wayne Emery. I said, Mr. Emery? And he said, yes, and he said, I have – Coach Mike Fratello and Mr. Gunn on the phone, and you know my antennas go up, and they said it's been a trade, and the first thing I said was, okay, um, where am I going? And they said, you know, Ben Baker and uh, Sherman Douglas is going from Milwaukee to Seattle, and you and Tyrone Hill is going from Cleveland to Milwaukee, and then when he says Sean Kemp is going from Seattle to Cleveland. That kind of took the sting out of it because I'm like, okay, at least I can say for the rest of my life I got traded for a superstar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't hating. You heard what, who was coming back. You say I ain't tripping. Look, yeah, that's the rain yeah. man. At the time, at the time, for respectfully, real. that was the, the deal. <laughs> Absolutely. What's that like as a player, though? Like, are you driving your car? It's a regular day, and then your entire life gets turned upside down in one phone call. It's wild because now, remember, I've been in Cleveland for six years, so I have a lot of things accumulated in my apartment. And all of a sudden, it changes so fast from, okay, what am I going to do? I have two or three weeks to go from Cleveland to Milwaukee uh, before training camp. I have to leave the next day, you know, to take a physical in Milwaukee and then come back to Cleveland. And then I have to talk to my realtors and pay up rent and then have my family come down and take care of everything. You know, I have piranhas in in my spot and everything. So I got to oh, wow. make sure that they're taken care of. And then now I have to get accumulation of clothes. But I'm living in a hotel because, you know, I don't know anything about Milwaukee yet. So all these factors and, you know, my car and what am I going to do with my truck? And I need something to you know, get from A to B. It happens so fast. And you really have to just slow down and organize and really, really get your, get your life in perspective in a real short amount of time. Cause Milwaukee, they want me there in training camp playing with Ray Allen and the big dog. And I got to get myself together. You had piranhas in your apartment. Wait, the tiger wouldn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of piranhas as a pet. I had two of them in there. <laughs> Just two small ones. It's like about a handful. That's all. <laughs> Need to feed them goldfish. What, you used to feed them goldfish? Is that what you said? Absolutely. <laughs> and just wow. watch them eat? Like, what was... Now, now I'm fascinated, Terrell. <laughs> like, like, you gotta, you gotta walk me through that my, whole process. Hey, check us out. My late mom, rest in peace, my mom, Charlotte Brandon, she hated it. When she came and saw me, I put the goldfish in, I turned the lights off, and she said, oh, that is so pretty. Those goldfish are so pretty, son. I said, yes. And then she saw the piranhas was, was like, ate like... Like, like the head and left the tail. She said, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, oh, did I throw you out? She, she didn't like that after that. She was like, uh -uh, get <laughs> Oh, my goodness. You know, you know, Terrell, like, I, like, I, I, I've been watching these little shows, and it, and it talks about how good pro players are, right? And, and like, they, they go and say, okay, like, they have Brian Scalabrini, right? Um, former uh, Boston Celtics, he'll go play like regular guys that are in the gym. 
And Brian Scalabrini looks like the second coming of Akeem Olajuwon. He won't miss. He's blocking their shots. Um, if you were to play right now, right, um, would you still dominate in pickup games? Do you play often, or do you you find runs and, and places to go now um, playing against regular guys? No, no, not at all. I haven't played in 23 <laughs> years. Wow, <laughs> two, three years. Wow. I could, imagine, I could imagine y'all for real going out and playing for fun. You know, I haven't played for fun since I was in the second grade. Mm. You know, yeah. I had a goal in mind. And so to go out and like, some people say, just go shoot some hoops. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so, you know, I had, you know, I retired for a reason. I had four surgeries on my knees. So I'm almost 53 yeah. years old. I don't need to be out there trying to, you know, <laughs> go back to memory. Yeah, yeah. Right. I hear that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But if, if I even tried to go out right now and play, I would go back to when I was playing with Kevin Garnett. And I can't do that. Right. So I might as well just leave the watch. Yeah. Interesting. Knowing your limits, right, as you get older. Terrell, um, getting back to the current team and the current Cavs, obviously we're all going crazy. We're frustrated. And, and we're what do we do? What, do they fire the coach? Do they change the team? What do you think the Cavs should do? I mean, obviously, even if even if you believe we're overreacting, there are some things that need to be done. The bench is not good enough. It's going to be challenging. But uh, in terms of their four top players, Garland, Mitchell, Mobley, Allen, would you make any changes there? Or would you stick with those four and try to change the rest of the group? Yeah, I would stick with those four. Absolutely. I mean, they're all young. You know, they seem like they're all coachable. And that's what you need in young players that's getting better. You need them to be coachable. If they're that coachable, then, you know, you might as well get rid, rid of them. And I don't know any of them personally, but, you know, I watch them, in, you know, from a distance. And all of them seem like they're nice young men. Keep the core. But anytime you lose, particularly in the first round, there has to be some changes, you know. And I think shot selection has to be emphasized a lot, particularly in the playoffs, which I, I feel – that because we're so young that we can learn from that. We can, you know, the team can watch film and say, you know, once we get in this position again, because if you want to be a great team, you would have been a playoff contention team every year. You will get into the same position again. Once we get in this position again, that's be more confident. The Cavs, we turned down a lot of shots that fourth quarter as well. A lot of good shots. And sometimes that can become from, mental fatigue you know what i'm saying because it's yeah. a long season we can learn from that all right sure. go ahead jay i'm just curious what you think of today's game and the way it's such a different game than when you played i looked real quick you were about a 35 36 percent three-point shooter in your career how would you have fared in today's game shoot i probably would have shot 10 threes yep <laughs> yep you know, I was talking to someone today. I, I was actually uh, watching um, Golden State last night, and uh, one of Clay Thompson's, he hit that clutch um, jump shot in the corner. And I said, wow, when we played, that would have been the, a terrible, great shot. You know? Yeah. The, the, the times have changed, and they didn't emphasize the three-pointer as much as they, use, they, they do now, of course. They called them marksmen back when in the 80s and 90s, like a Chuck person or – uh, Dell Ellis, someone, you know, Hershey Hawkins, guys who really, Mark Price, guys who really shot those. Now, there's a lot of players shooting threes. You know, even on, you know, three on two, two on one, fast break, they're stopping at the three point line and they're firing up. So if I was playing right now, I would put more emphasis on the three point line. That's for sure. Was it ever considered a bad shot? I'm just curious. Like, did you ever get yelled at for taking threes? Did coaches ever view that as a bad shot? You talking about myself? Yeah, just that during your playing days. Did coaches in, of that era, because now it's all layups and threes. But did back then, I'm just wondering if coaches, because I really don't know the answer, did coaches view the three-point shot as a bad shot? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, wow. it was a bad shot. But then what happened was with me, um, in 94, 95, I believe, they moved the three-point line in. Mm. And so when they moved it in, 
coaches couldn't emphasize it being a bad shot. Now right. it's you know, 18, 19 feet. So coaches had to kind of renege on what they were saying. <laughs> hmm. Wow. All right, Mike, you got a quickie before we wrap up? I got one, one yeah, more. Yeah, I got yeah. one quick one for you. As a, you know, four-point guard. Say it again, Terrell. Y'all got me up early, man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this, is, this is a good question here, yeah. I promise. As a, you know, former point guard, you got a chance to run with a lot of elite players and elite shooters. And a point guard's main goal is to be able to pick out who's open and who's got the best shot when and where. Of us four, looking on the panel, who do you think is the best shooter <laughs> oh out of us God. four? I mean, really going to ask that guy. question? Yes. Um, I mean, come on now. Mm, None of us can mm, shoot. Mm. I can't shoot. Uh, you're giving it away. I'm sorry. So all y'all admit that you're can't shoot now. Well, I so, can't. Uh, like, oh. <laughs> That's the point guard's job. Um, this is what he does. This, this is what a, he did for a This is a, a trick living. question, Terrell. There's a reason he's asking you, know, you. Okay, check this out. All of you, raise your hand right now. See, the way you raise your hand, I'll pick my man in the middle. G. Bush. G. G. Bush. You know, I, I, play. I think Mike, I'm you hurt. think you're a better shooter than Mikey? It actually hurts my ego. Uh, he, probably, yeah. he probably definitely right. shoots better than me now. Yeah, um, like that. So, you know what I'm saying? The, ans the answer is Mikey. He Every opportunity, he yeah. wants to tell everyone that he played Division three college ball. He yeah. did play higher, oh, higher level than me. I, I only yeah. played I only played Division one basketball. I just, like, I just think I exuberate this energy of, like, an elite shooter. So, I'm curious up a if word? on the West Coast, you <laughs> can still feel it. Now you just made up a word. Now exuberates, exuberates a real word. That's not a word. And the, the Cavs back in the day, they had listen. They had they you know Mark Price, Steve Kerr can knock it down. Heck, Kevin Johnson back in the day can knock it down. Uh, Craig Elo used to be able to shoot. So the Cavs had some ball yeah. players coming off the bench like that really could really knock it down a little bit back then. Well, Mikey, clearly game doesn't always recognize game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is what it is. I'm That's hurt. True. It's okay, though, Terrell. Hey, it's Terrell, okay. let me, I'm going to give you some rapid fires. You, you pick the winner, okay? You ready? Okay. Bill Russell or Will Chamberlain? Pause. That's impossible. You stumped him. Will Chamberlain. Woo. Hakeem Olajuwon, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. <sighs> <laughs> Magic. Magic. Yes. Mark Price, John Stockton. Mark Price, definitely. Got to go with uh, your guy. Yeah. LeBron or MJ? MJ. See, he's from he's from that era. He's from that era. He, yeah. he don't he didn't even hesitate. He's just like he was ready. He knew he was coming on here. That he, yeah. he was like, yeah, they are gonna ask me about that. I'm I'm ready for all the smoke. All the <laughs> listen, can't be his guy, Austin. Them old dude, the OGs. Yeah. OGs don't be playing. Come on, man. Y'all don't understand how it was, young blood. Back, yeah, back yeah. then, well, we, they hand. I'm old you. enough, man. <laughs> listen, I Terrell, I'm. No good at basketball at all. I was never good as a kid. Obviously, I'm fat. You know, I wasn't as I wasn't fat as a kid, but I was never <laughs> good at basketball. But I grew up in the, in New York City, and I would watch the good players play in like the New York City courts. I'd go to Manhattan. We'd go to all these cool courts to watch some of these guys, these street ballers, play, and they were awesome. And in New York, no blood, no foul. Now these guys, they cry about everything now. They're uh, everything. They're crying. They're looking for a foul. I totally agree. I was just yeah. on. Uh... Um, a series with uh, Rick Mahorn. Yeah. This past weekend, and we talked about it. And I said, man, I remember when you know they knock you down, and the opponent never picked you up. They didn't yeah. call favorite ones for fouls. You know, uh, Bill Ambeer dislocated my shoulder, and uh, Coach Lenny Wilkins called a twenty-second timeout. <laughs> they popped it back. <laughs> Line and shot two free throws. <laughs> the game was I'm to like, me. In the back, like you know, like no, just pop it back and <laughs> let's go. Man, to me, the get NBA was the best, like 80s and 90s. That's the best NBA yeah. for me. Yeah, I mean, there was so between yeah. between the 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 you know, obviously you guys had a great team, the Pistons, uh, the the Celtics, the Lakers, the 76ers. I mean, and then the, eventually the Rockets and the Bulls, and and even even to the to that Knicks Heat rivalry which was nasty 
the Pacers, you know, like it, 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 there was so many great rivalries and now it's just, I don't know. I mean, the NBA is still good. I just don't like it as much because I like paint, you know, guys beating the crap out of each other, hard fouls, not being all friendly. Like I, I miss the, the old school post players, right? Like I, and now everybody shoots the ball. I want to see some guys battling in the paint. Ah! I don't get that. Anymore. What was Absolute. that noise? Yeah. Totally agree. You know, I, I wish that, you know, maybe uh, Mr. Alan Silver can just go and say, listen, because he's from that era. Yeah. I remember him when he was a, a general back in the day with uh, Mr. Stern. And he understands where us former players and people like you is coming from. Yeah. That's why Draymond Green and other people are so draw back by that style. But people like us, man, you know, you got to have somebody on your team that the elevator don't go to the top floor. You got to <laughs> have at least <laughs> Our foul, yeah. it, it works. You know, yeah. It works. I think I think those those Patrick Ewing Knicks teams, they had a lot of players that elevator did not go to the top of the floor. I mean, they had some bad dudes. They were fun to watch. Anthony Oakley and all those guys, they was crazy. Yeah. Anthony Mason's elevator is out of order. Yeah, he was he, he took was, the stairs. He he put but I tell you what, he would have kicked that. He gave everything to get every rebound. Yep. He got every inch out of the, out of his talent. Because I don't know how, how talented he was, but man, he got every ounce of talent that yep. he could possibly get. Anyway, yep. I'm reminiscing too much about the old. Wait, wait, Terrell, yeah. I got one more serious question. Yeah. Did you play with Bill Curley in Minnesota? In ninety eight, I played with him for about um I think it was about a year or so, yes. That's my college coach. Cool dude. Good dude. You got any good curly what? stories? Yeah. Oh man, Curly was real cool, man. He was just real quiet and real reserved, and you know, we got along extremely well. He, he was, he was nothing controversial about him at all. Nothing. Who was the best trash talker you played against? Definitely not Curly. <laughs> uh, Larry Bird. That's Everybody a, says that. That's, yeah. that's he's the, the goat. The he's the best trash talker that. ever. He is the goat of trash talkers, Bird. So like, and. So what was the fun? Like, did he say anything to you? Like, he, was he funny? Was he mean? Like, what, what did he do? I was surprised because this particular time, Price was out, and I was starting against the Celtics. Yeah. And he was killing us. And he said, um, hey, Rook, tell Coach Lenny Wilkins why he got this white kid, Craig Elo, guard me. You better put a brother on me. And I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Offended. He was offended. <laughs> I want to say, you know, remember you white, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> nah, he wasn't. He's the most black white dude ever played in the oh NBA. Oh my god, that is so funny. <laughs> Man, he, he he was a legend for real, and he let us know I'm going to go over here with 2.1 seconds. I'm going to go like this, shoot back. You know that yep. that little yep. vocal little jumper he had. And he'll tell you exactly where he's going to hit it, and then he'll hit it, and he'll walk off. If you see some tapes, a lot of people was always jumping on him when he would uh, make last-second shots, but everybody was surprised but him. Hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Terrell, we appreciate it, man. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for getting up early. We'll talk to you again soon, man. Be well. All right, you too, anytime. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. Thanks, Terrell. Have some fun with Terrell. Man, man Larry Bird, man, he always gets – he's always – people Charles, always yep. Charles Oakley said that. Yeah. Like, it's crazy, man. Yep. Like That is a funny story. He says, <laughs> put a brother, put a brother on, on me. Put a brother on me, man. Hey. He's insulted. Why does <laughs> white guy guard me? Yeah, that, man, it's, it's unacceptable. <laughs> hey, so yeah. while we've been on for the last hour, we yeah. have seen some of the exit interview quotes from the Cavs, and a couple have been – uh, I saw the, the Jared Allen one. We'll get Go to ahead. the Allen one in a second. Yeah. I want to start with the Ricky Rubio one. You can take tag board full here, Steven. Shout out to our guy, Evan Damerel from Locked on Cavs for uh, transcribing and tweeting these out. But this is what Ricky Rubio said. If you ask anyone in our locker room, we were the better team than the Knicks. We were more talented. Th- were they more talented than us? No. They just wanted it more than we did. Mm. Y'all just got Molly Watt 4-1. I'm not sure you could, could say that out loud in good conscience. Well, it's team. also embarrassing to say they wanted it more. Yeah, yeah, like that's yeah. horribly. And the follow-up question is, why? Why did they want it more? Why? Wow, we, that's embarrassing. You ready for the Jared Allen quote? I, we got. I got five of these. So yes. we'll yeah, yeah, these go, we go, go back up, and we'll go dissect up. them yeah. after. Yeah. 
Uh, two from Jared Allen, who's in his third playoff series for the record. Even for me, the lights were brighter than expected. He played in New York. You played for Brooklyn. Yeah. Crazy. I mean, you not- played in the playoffs in New York. Crazy. Like he just now, act, he just it, acted like that never happened. Like he's a newborn. In, in fairness, nobody gives a rat's ass about the Nets in New York. But, but you still, still yeah. He paid taxes in New York and was there. He drove from the facility to don't his. Don't you home. know rich people don't pay taxes? Oh my gosh! Just I don't understand it. How? That's like, embarrassing. I, I guess I will give him credit for honesty. Oh my God. I'm not admitting to that. I'm not admitting to that. Embarrassing. We have another quote from Jared Allen. Oh my Steve, next God. tag board. The elephant in the room is those damn offensive rebounds. I should have been better. That's my good. job. Yeah, I like no that. Shit, that is, own it. That's good. Yeah. For better or worse, Accountability, he man. was brutally honest. Yeah, that's brutally great. Honest. That's great. The first one infuriates me. That one I like. <laughs> oh, my God. The and we have two from break. Donovan Mitchell, and then we'll go back and we'll recap all these. Is the Donovan Mitchell bragging Mitchell. about a 71-point game? He did not, but he Are says. Are still slurping him for a 71-point game? Pause. I told the guys, if you go through your first playoff series in Madison Square Garden, you'll be all right. That place is different. Oh, shut and up, And go Donovan. to the next one, Anthony, give me directly the next one. And this was how the series ended and the season in totality wrapped up. I wouldn't want it any other way. I work hard at this, and there's beauty in the pain. There will be time to figure it out, and I know we will. I don't the know what that process. means. What the hell is he talking about? I don't know what that means. Did Kyrie Irving body switch you? <laughs> that's hey, a Kyrie comment. Guess yeah, what? Kyrie guess comment. what? It's a good goal. Boston is just as hostile as New York. Toronto can be hostile. I mean, Golden State used to be. I don't know anymore yeah. with that new arena. Like, yeah, I mean, New York is different. It is. But there's a lot of hostile. That Philly, Philly's in the not NBA. hostile? That just I've go- never seen it in a playoff Philly's series. Hostile. I've never seen it in a playoff that series. That just shows me that. that there's no accountability. There was none from I wouldn't none from anybody. Any other way. Like, like the fact that nobody in the coaching staff said, what the hell is that, bro? We need to get out here and play a certain way. And I demand it or you will be on the bench. Like, I don't, I'm confused why this, this laissez-faire attitude is here. Yeah. It's almost what, like, what man, we lost. What are you going to do? You know, I wouldn't uh, want to vacation. It, they wanted it more. They like, wanted really? it more. They admitted the lights to, were bright. It, they admitted the other team wanted oh it more. Oh, my God. I, listen. To, I, be a competi- to be in the NBA in a competitive I'm nature, to, to admit like, that listen, they I wanted it more. I mean, it was more. clear watching it that the Knicks wanted it more. But I'm, I mean, they're, they're more refreshing mm. than the Browns when they have theirs because the Browns are just straight up live and filibuster. But these dudes came out, and I, I give you credit for being honest, but I'm going to be honest. If, if you watch Kobe Altman and the rest of the guys, uh, this, is, this is what they told you. And it is utterly disrespectful if you feel like you're going to bring the same energy back next year. Because I'm just not going to. I'm not going to pay attention to it. I, I like. I, I these guys just didn't care. They didn't care, and admitted to it. <laughs> I'm not watching that. But at least they won 50 games without LeBron. Th- that's all that matters. Yeah. 51. They did it without LeBron, boy. What's that? 51. Don't short them. Yeah. Okay. They did win a playoff game without LeBron. They, they won, won one. one. Yep. They won one. one. One in six in uh, uh, postseason games or and, and, whatever. And I'm a, uh, by the way, years. by the way, I'm gonna just jump since everybody is making a, a a question. Yeah. I'm stripping all the medals. I apologize for the fans. Hey. I'm about the Marion Jones, y'all. The medals are coming back. Yeah. Donovan Mitchell is not about to be in the top anything. No. He is now below Kyrie Irving. I'm not even adjusting that. Second of all, that was on me. That was on me for even suggesting yeah. that these people That's were uh, up any level. Bye. And from now on, LeBron James' name shall not be mentioned yeah. with any new guys. I, I think no Earl's got to apologize that for that every Earl, day. Earl, Earl, I want to apologize to the great people of Cleveland, yeah. to all my fellow co-workers and friends on this here show. Yeah. You know, I was emotional. I was a little out of pocket. He was going through some stuff. And I we got were. checked, yeah. you know, Don, as I should have. Donovan that won't ever Mitchell happen is not in the top five of all-time Cavs. I First just all, noticed this was on the set. The How, long has this been on the, How long has this been on the set? Since yesterday. Just a couple of days. <laughs> oh! That's where, that's where the junkyard dog chain's going. Yeah, junkyard I mean, dog I missed. Chain. Yeah. <laughs> well, Eventually, it's going in the garden. It's appropriate I, that he missed. I hit the trash. Wow. But I missed. But That's what we think don't, of the don't give right me, Don't give me no junkyard dog chain yeah, talk yeah, yeah, come on, man. anymore. Right. Yeah, right. No more junkyard yeah. dog. Come on. You got a bunch of store-bought that ch- mutts. That chain goes... <laughs> 
<laughs> your pet, but your pal Pets Land. Shout out this segment is brought to you by Pets Land. Right now, you get kibbles and bits, two for five dollars, <laughs> two for five dollars, and long rope shoes as well. Come on over here. We'll get you set up down at PetSmart.com. By the way, oh, so Christy now you want to get ad reads in. <laughs> <laughs> now you want to get to the ad. By the way, Tristan Thompson, better calf than Donovan Mitchell. Yes. Not, even, not even close. Not even close. Z. Not even close. All right, Zajunas let's tap the brakes. Not even close. Let's tap the brakes. Not even Goskis. close. Z is Give me big Anderson Varejao. <laughs> God, Andy and all his hair. Wesley Person, better Cav than Donovan. Sasha Pavlovich. Let's settle down. Sean Kemp and his 52 kids. <laughs> Shannon Brown. Shannon Brown and Monica. Danny Shelton. Oh. Steve Kerr. <laughs> Steve Kerr. We'll see you on overtime, you overtime. crazy people. Later. <laughs>